1991, my mother was killed in a tragic auto pedestrian accident. Funeral arrangements were made, family gathered in the city where she lived, and we all returned home and carried on. About a month later, I was sleeping at home when the phone rang about 3am. I had to get up to answer it, as the only phone was in the kitchen. There was a, a lot of static on the line, and then, amazingly, I heard my mother's voice. She had a very distinctive voice. She sounded like Lucille Ball, so I could tell who it was immediately. I was so shocked I just couldn't make any sense of it. I remember that I said, Mother, where are you? All kinds of things were going through my mind. Was there maybe a case of mistaken identity? Was she not dead, but maybe just hurt instead, and couldn't remember anything? She seemed very confused and sort of frustrated, wouldn't answer any of my questions, but kept saying that she had to find June. She had lived on a road called Lake June Road, so I thought that that was what she meant. I was frantically trying to get her to say where she was, telling her that I wanted to help her, but after mentioning June a couple of more times, there was more static, and then the line went dead. I sat in the dark for a long time, wondering what to do and what the heck had just happened, and if possibly I'd imagined the whole thing. Finally, it was time to go to work, and I got ready and went. When I got to work, my dear friend and co-worker were a little bit late that morning too. When she arrived, she told me that she had a really bad night, and I said, tell me about it, you and me both. Then my face went white, and my hair stood on end, as she told me, yeah, my last night at about three, my Aunt June passed away. This story comes from Belgium and took place in 2020, during COVID confinements. I was 20 back then, and at that time, because of the severity of the pandemic in Belgium, the law stated that you could only go out to practice sports or to work, so I took the habit of meeting with a friend, Sully, to go out for runs and to practice all kinds of sports in general. Both of us were quite fond of urban exploration and knew a spot in the outskirts of Brussels consisting of an old sports and wellness center where we took the habit to hang out after our runs at. To get into this spot, you have to go through a hole in a fence on a street, cross a small portion of woods, and you'll come up on a football pitch and tennis court, end up on a hill as the center which is an old four-story building. The whole center takes a, a whole street block pretty much. On that day, we had just finished a five kilometer run and went out to our spot as usual. We were walking to the building since it was about to rain when we saw two teenagers sitting on the roof edge and I remember thinking that it bothered me since we were planning to go to the roof as well. So we went to the hall area instead to wait for a bit in hopes that those guys would leave. In the hall area you sort of have a clear view into the kitchen which you have to go through if you want to go to the roof. You can also see into another smaller hall and into the dining room as well. Sully was rolling himself a cigarette whilst I was sort of gathering two chairs and an office table for us to sit at. And this next part, it honestly gives me chills when I think about it. So as I finished setting everything up, I remember starting to feel a, a little unwell for some reason. Like I was being watched or something and not in a good way. That's when I looked at the kitchen and saw, for a brief moment, a head sticking out of the doorframe and staring right at us. It was a man. I couldn't say what age he was since he was all dirty, but the one thing that I remember is that he had a really exaggerated happy expression on his face, like he had just found exactly what he was looking for. At that moment, I just froze and was unable to react bravely to the situation. I sort of leaned slowly towards Sully, all whilst keeping eye contact with the man, and told him very calmly that we had to go immediately. I tend to make lots of jokes to all of my friends, and especially to Sully, but when he saw the look that I had on my face when I told him that we had to leave, he didn't say a word, just took his backpack and stood up. 
We ran to the football pitch and saw that the two teenagers, they were still on the roof, so we started to yell at them asking if the man was with them or if they saw him, but they answered that no, they hadn't seen anyone and that they had come by themselves, so if someone was there, he wasn't with them. We told them that it was probably better for them to leave as well since we didn't know what the man in the lobby was up to. They told us that they would be fine and that they would leave a bit after. We decided to leave since we already told them what we saw and we also had been out pretty long at this point. It wasn't actually legal with confinement rules for us to be out this long as well. And as we were walking towards the woods, I turned back and I swear that I saw a silhouette standing in front of the staircase leading to the roof but my mind didn't quite react and I just left alongside with my friend. I guess I was so shocked because nothing like this had ever happened to me before that I just decided not to talk about it to anyone in fear of them not believing me or possibly making fun of me I guess. My friend Sully is the only one who was with me that day and he didn't take a look at that man but he is pretty much as scared as I was just by seeing my own reaction at that time. I don't know what happened to those teenagers but I did eventually find local articles and papers dating from that time about teenagers being chased by a crazy man in an abandoned building, but the information given wasn't enough for me to be sure that it was the same people and even the same story. All I know is what I saw, and to be honest, I'm grateful that I did see it, because if I hadn't, I shudder to think what may have happened. This happened many years ago now when I was about 10 or 11 years old. I wouldn't describe the area that I was in as backwoods necessarily, but it was a wooded 100 plus acre ranch. The land is in the southwest part of the United States. My family owns the property and we have family reunions every year and all stay for about five days to camp. There's an area of the ranch too where we all set up camp and cook and eat getting to that part of the ranch requires driving through a small village and several gates for about two miles. The first gate beyond the village is slightly past a set of railroad tracks. And while that's a bit of a description, I admit, it is relevant later in the story. Now, because I had been camping at the ranch for as long as I really could remember, and the land was private, my parents would allow me to go off on my own during the day, as long as I didn't go too far. I'd spend time walking the property near our camp area, looking for arrowheads or trying to catch tadpoles in the ponds, stuff like that. On this day, I left the large camp area after lunch, which was around 11.30, and told my mum that I was going to a nearby creek. I planned on catching some tadpoles to bring back to the camp and be back on time for a swimming trip my cousins were planning. They wanted to go to a nearby river and I really didn't want to miss it. I made it down to the creek and got several tadpoles. I probably spent a total of 15 minutes down there, I would guess. To get back to camp, I would have needed to either climb up a relatively steep embankment with a lot of loose rock or circle around on a longer route with a flat trail. I would usually go up the embankment, but I didn't have a top for the water bottle that I caught the tadpoles with, and I didn't want to risk slipping and spilling them out and killing them. I had never walked the longer trail by myself, mind you, but I had with my dad and felt confident that I could find my way back to the camp. Anyway, as I walked back to the camp, I had my head down just looking for arrowheads in the washed out areas of the trail, when I started feeling a, a little creeped out as I continued walking. We all know that feeling like someone is watching you. It was unsettling, but I chalked it up to just getting spooked and being on a trail by myself or whatever. Now, the next part I cannot explain, because it's as if a light switch just turned on or someone snapped their fingers and I came back to reality. Except when I came to, I was no longer on the trail that I had been on before. I was now near the railroad tracks and it was completely dark. My mum was standing in front of me, shaking my shoulders and yelling, where were you? 
Two things I remember really clearly about the moments I came to are, one, the look of fear, anger, relief in my mum's tearful eyes as she was yelling at me, and two, the confusion that I felt about what the heck was going on. I mean, the last thing I remembered was just walking on the trail back to the camp, and now suddenly it was dark and I was at the railroad tracks leading to the ranch, which was over two miles away. The best that I can describe it is to compare it to the movie The Butterfly Effect. The main character would be living in one moment, then suddenly he'd just wake up somewhere entirely different. In any case, my parents drove me back to the camp and I learned that it was 10.30pm. This meant that I'd been gone for 11 hours, about 10 and a half of which I cannot account for to this day. My parents and all of my family had understandably freaked out when I hadn't returned to the camp. They had been looking for me all day. I was a really good kid though growing up and almost never broke any rules so my parents were baffled at my behavior that day. I tried to explain to them that I really had no memory of getting to the tracks but they didn't believe me. They thought maybe I just got lost and was too embarrassed to admit it. This was the only time that I've ever experienced something like this and I cannot explain just how unsettling it is to not be able to account for all of those hours that I was gone. Was it coincidence that I had that sort of creeped out feeling on the trail and then just lost ten and a half hours of my life like that? I wish I had answers for what happened, but honestly I really don't know if I ever will, which is why I'm here. Have any of you ever had anything similar happen? And if you have, then I would love to hear it. This happened to me when I was 17 years old. I was just about to graduate high school. I was homeschooled and very encouraged to pursue entrepreneurship. I was trying to establish a photography business that I could run after graduating. In order to build my portfolio, I decided to ask a few friends and acquaintances to model for me. I asked a girl I worked with if she and her husband would like to model a couple of sessions for me. It would be a win-win since they would receive free photos anyway, and I would get to add them to my website as sample work. So we planned a day to meet, and I asked them to meet at a local park one evening. Something you should know too about this park is that it is pretty far out in the country, the park has soccer fields, baseball fields, a golf course and walking trails so it is on a large plot of land and fairly secluded. The only house in view of the park is the caretaker's home directly across the street from the entrance. And unless there is an event or a weekend, there is usually not many people there. I felt pretty confident meeting the couple there because I was only planning to arrive about 15 minutes early to set up anyway so I wouldn't be alone long anyway. Now, the park has an entrance where you can drive down a road into the parking lot to get to all the sports fields, playground, and down to the pond as well. The front of the park has a large grassy strip which is where I was planning to set up for the photos. I bypassed the entrance and pulled into a little dirt section at the front of the park and began unloading all of my props. I was always taught to be a cautious person, especially as a young woman, so I took a quick glance to see if anyone was at the park. I saw one car in the parking lot and two guys tossing a baseball in the baseball field along with their pit bull. Across the street I could see the caretaker out in her yard so that made me feel a lot better. I decided that I would just keep an eye out and continued setting up my things. I would glance up every now and then to make sure that the two men were still on the baseball field and I mean I really had no reason to believe that they would bother me but something in my gut just told me to keep watch. The couple that I was waiting on seemed to be running late. I finished my setup and glanced up to check on the two guys. And to my horror, they were gone. The car was still there, but the men and the dog were nowhere in sight. There was a bit of a hill in front of me that blocked some of the park entrance from sight, so I thought maybe they had just decided to walk one of the nature trails or whatever. But again, that feeling in my gut just told me that something was wrong. I looked at the caretaker's house and she had gone back inside. 
I couldn't get everything back into the car quickly, so I just grabbed my camera equipment and hopped into my car. I locked the doors, turned on the ignition, and got my phone out. And literally, as soon as I got settled in my car, I see the two guys coming over the hill with their dog. I feel my gut feeling melt into panic. I mean, you have to understand that there is no reason for them to come up where I was. It's literally just an open grassy field. If the dog needed to relieve himself, then there was plenty of space for that at the edges of the wood, or the nature trail, or the walk to the pond, all of which were way closer to them than where I was. But they walked around my setup, and when they got to my car, one guy went around the front, and the one holding the dog on the leash circled my car. I assumed that they had realized that I had already noticed that they were coming, and that I was no longer vulnerable because they rejoined and walked further down, up, and around the soccer field. Once I felt that I was no longer in danger, I glanced down at my phone to see that the couple that I was supposed to meet had apparently forgotten about it and were at the beach. I was so fed up at that point that I jumped out of the car, grabbed all of my props, and just shoved them in. This was my first experience of how scary it can be to be a woman out there alone like this. I've had some other experiences since then, but this one always sticks out to me the most because I am absolutely certain that those guys intended to do me harm. And what kind of match would a 17-year-old girl be against two grown men and a pit bull? One thing is for certain, though. I will never go back to that park alone. I was in school about 15 years ago. A group of friends and I were hanging out at our friend Dale's house. We lived way out in the country, also technically part of Appalachia, in the kind of middle of nowhere where the nearest neighbors are a few miles up the road. Dale happened to have a cave near his property that we liked to explore and be dumb teenagers in. To get to the cave, you had to walk roughly a mile through dense woods and cross a big field. We had yet to find the end of the cave system, despite exploring for hours at a time multiple times. And one day, we had spent the better part of the afternoon exploring the caves, and it had gotten dark by the time that we emerged. We already had flashlights, so that was no big deal. My memory is a little bit fuzzy on the exact details, but for some reason our friend Sam decided to go back to the house a little earlier. I want to say that he ordered pizza or something and he went to meet the driver or something like that. But the rest of us started making our way back through the woods to Dale's house when we started hearing voices in the woods. We were asking each other if we heard that and where it was coming from, but we each had a different direction of where we thought that it was coming from. Whatever it was, it was a childlike voice and it sounded like talking or whispering, but you really couldn't make out what was being said. At this point, we thought one of our friends was messing with us and started to talk back to it. It sounded like a child giggling though and then our flashlight started to flicker and die as well. We now had one dim light left to get the rest of the way back. We were all thoroughly freaked out, prank or not, then hightailed it back to the house, adrenaline pumping. We all got into the house, shut the door and... I felt a sense of safety for a split second before the crucifix on the wall literally came off the wall and broke on the floor. It seems like something out of a bad horror movie, I know, but we all watched it legitimately come off the wall and crash to the ground for no apparent reason. Before that moment, I hadn't been convinced that it wasn't our other friend Sam that was messing with us, even though he really wasn't the type. We all started word vomiting at Sam trying to explain what had just happened and question if he had something to do with it, but he genuinely seemed freaked out and confused. He actually said that on his way back to the house earlier, he kept hearing weird things and seeing lights in the woods and he thought it was us trying to play a prank on him. To this day, I still don't know what it was. And sure, maybe our friend is a great actor, but I honestly don't think that it was a prank. The feeling that I got in the woods, like every hair standing on end, goosebumps on goosebumps, and every fiber of my being screaming to run, I've never felt that again, 
even with pranks, and never want to. This happened a few weeks ago and it was so bizarre that I still think about it every so often. I was babysitting my nieces, 8 and 10, since my sister was going out to meet this other girl at a coffee shop. I offered to babysit my nieces since her house was nice and I didn't have anything else to do that night, so I decided why not. At first, we just watched movies and played video games together. Later on into the night, I noticed they didn't eat anything, and so I asked them if they were hungry. They both replied no at first. That's when I said that I can make a quasadilla for them, or anything else they want. They still replied no. When I mentioned pizza, they immediately yelled yes. Of course they would. And well, that was a bad idea that night. When I called the local pizza hut, I ordered two large pizzas to be delivered. Keep in mind that I went outside to make this phone call, quite loudly I should say, because it was dead silent outside as well. I only went outside because I noticed a bag on the street, and I thought that it was mine or somebody else's. It was just trash when I looked closely at it. I'm assuming that this was the neighbor's trash bag. Anyway, 20 minutes go by and I hear a doorbell ring. It was the Pizza Hut delivery girl. I paid her in cash and I took the pizzas to the kitchen where my nieces were eating at. And this is when the weird stuff happens. You see, not even 10 minutes go by and I hear the doorbell again. I was skeptical at first and looked out the window. It was hard to see much of anything by this point. I opened the door, only to be greeted by an old man with a pizza box in his hand. He says to me, Hello son, I got your pizza that you ordered. I tried to answer in a way that would divert the situation. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't order any pizza. You must have got the wrong location. That's when I tried to close the door, but he pushed his hand on the door, hard. Are you sure? He replied. I firmly replied back, yes, and I closed the door. I thought that that was the end of that. Until one of my nieces told me, why is there a man just standing outside of our house? I was confused, but my heart started to pound when I thought that it was the same old man from earlier. And I was right. It was the same old man, still standing outside the house with the pizza box still in his hand. I was absolutely livid. I opened the door furiously and yelled at him that I would call the cops immediately. He ran off at that. My sister arrived two hours later and I told her of what happened. She looked immediately concerned and then asked who it was. I told her that it was an old man who impersonated a pizza delivery worker. I don't know what she did after I told her. I'm not sure if she called the cops to file a report or not. But what I do know is that it is a night I won't be forgetting quickly. I never really tell anyone about this story, but hearing all the stories here, I feel like I should share it. Because of this, I don't go on walks alone or even with friends, unless it's in a very public place. But even then, I still am paranoid, I admit. With that being said, my friend's family had just moved to a new town 15 minutes from where I lived. It was a complete ghost town, with one tiny grocery store, a post office, and a school. This town was so secluded and quiet that I rarely ever saw cars drive by. One night though, as we were unpacking boxes, we heard a knock at the door. It was a big tall guy with a shotgun in his hands. Being from Oklahoma, this could mean that you're either meeting your hick new neighbor, or it's actually someone wanting to harm us. Turns out it was just a hick neighbor coming in to introduce himself. He told my friend's mom about the lack of police and how everyone tends to carry their own guns in order to protect themselves, because the police were usually no help and 15 minutes away anyway. He also talked about how these areas can be dangerous and that my friend's mom should keep a gun with her. At this time, I was 13 years old and knowing this information, you would think that I would simply stay my butt inside and not wander the streets of this dangerous hillbilly ghost town, but I did. 
There was no service, no cable, and nothing to do but go outside. We would walk to the store and get snacks, walk to the school and play on the playground. Majority of the time we wouldn't see a single car or person, but the same clerk in the grocery store on every walk that we took. Now, there was a day that my dad had brought me to her house, and right off the bat we walked to the park. That day I was sick to my stomach, but was eager to go and see my friend, so I went anyways. I had a terrible feeling for some reason, and now that I'm older and have experienced bad anxiety, I can now say that that day I was experiencing some pretty bad anxiety, and didn't know why I felt this way. When we got there, we had actually ended up hanging out with an old friend who had transferred to this school a year prior. After he left, we sat on the bench for what felt like ages, taking selfies and just talking. When all of a sudden, the stereotypical creepy van pulls up to the park. Now, my friend was and still is way braver than I was and will ever be and she is always the daredevil type. But for some reason, around this time... I just assumed it was a family coming to play, and my anxiety wasn't there. But my friend was scared, and she immediately had a bad feeling when the van pulled up, and I could tell that she was ready to leave. In the end, though, we decided to stay and see who it was before we just ran off. Of course, like something out of a movie, came out two big men, literally barreling over to where we were. We immediately started to run away, and they tried to follow and grab us. They got back into the van eventually and followed us. I have no idea how too, but they didn't catch up to us, but we just ran as fast as we could up the road and straight to the grocery store. I was horrified when we got inside and I couldn't even speak. That sick feeling that I felt on the way to my friend's house made complete sense now. My mum was always watching true crime growing up and sometimes she would have me watch it with her so I was always really scared to walk around because of that. But even with that fear, I never thought that it would actually happen to me. The van was parked across the street, but eventually it drove off. We walked home with no way to call anyone, thinking that they could be waiting for us around every corner with absolutely nobody around. It was and still is the scariest day that I've had. I didn't tell anyone for years, which was stupid of me, I know, but at 13 years old, I didn't know what to do. I'm turning 21 soon, and this story still keeps me up at night sometimes. I can't help but imagine what would have happened if they had actually captured me and my friend, where we would have gone, and what would have happened to us. My grandparents owned about 20 acres of land in central Missouri, and throughout my childhood, my parents would send me to stay with them. The house that they lived in was very old. There was also a local legend that the guy who originally built it ritualistically killed his daughter and wife. In exchange, the devil supposedly gave him two magic rings. One allowed him to transform into a massive wolf, and the other allowed him to become a bear. My grandpa always loved to tell me that story just to freak me out, and quite honestly, none of us really ever believed it. But one night when I was about 10, my grandparents left me alone in the house to go and play poker at a friend's. And it was around 10pm when I began hearing howling circling the house. I was panicking, but then I heard scratching on the front door. Slow, methodical scratching. Not like it was trying to get in, but like it was doing it to intimidate me. The howling started to sound to me human around then as well, like somebody was yelling. Completely freaked out, I ran upstairs and hid under my bed. Eventually, the noises all stopped and I went to the window to look outside. In the moonlight, I saw a massive wolf standing in the front yard. It locked eyes with me and then it stood up on its back legs. I screamed at that and was crying. I hid under my bed until my grandparents got back hours later. Surprisingly too, they actually believed me because there were really large scratch marks on the front door. But weirdly, the marks started above the door. So high up, the one who carved them would have had to have been at least 8 feet tall. Now, 
I don't know if any of this is just coincidence or not, but the fact that I knew about that story and then this happened to me, I really don't know what to think. So this was May of 2017. My husband Jim and I, we own a five floor, hundred year old building, which has our business in it, an antique mall, our apartment upstairs, and various other tenants. We'd had several back-to-back -back burglaries in prior years and had reinforced the front doors of the business pretty intensely. Aggressive steel bars, more cameras, etc. But anyway, at 3am we were sound asleep upstairs, as one is, but then we got a call from our security company. We had a motion detection in an unusual location. Not the main floor where 90% of the jewellery is, but downstairs. That sort of thing is usually just a spider on the camera, or a mouse or something like that. So we ran out less than prepared. I was only wearing a tank top, undies and flip flops. Jim did not grab his baseball bat, but at least had pants on. I went one way to check the front door, which was intact, and Jim went the other to check around back. Suddenly though, he called me and said somebody's inside so I fumbled with my phone trying to call 911 in that situation your monkey brain is just in the driver's seat and the phone is the black monolith from 2001 finally though I managed it and rounded the back side of the building narrating to the 911 operator broken glass broken window I said too as I later heard during the run-up to the trial oh my goodness they're in there please come now then, there was an unholy crash. It sounded like everything inside was being smashed to bits. And the feeling of listening to someone busy destroying your livelihood is something that I cannot quite capture. Who was in there? How many? What path of destruction was being wreaked? I could only yell down the phone at a faceless voice begging for help that I knew was still minutes away. Bear in mind I was freshly woken into a horrible situation, barely clothed, and it was escalating by the second. As it turned out, the burglar, Troy, had come face to face with Jim, trying to exit the building out of the broken window before I'd arrived. They locked eyes and Troy reversed direction back to the depths of the building. Then he dropped his backpack with stolen merch flung himself bodily over a giant iron gate, smashed through the restaurant tenant's door, and then subsequently out their main door. At that point, he had caught a lot of glass to the face and body, and was bleeding pretty badly. Jim caught him on the exit, and pounced on him, full body slammed to the cement, then he pinned Troy. Adrenaline is wild. I wasn't crying, but urgently begging the operator to hurry. I was terrified that I was going to see my husband die before my eyes. And then I ran right into the fray because, again, adrenaline. It just gets right up on you and you just do the stupidest stuff when high on adrenaline like that. They were in the middle of the street though, dimly orange lit by the street lights, and it was hard to pass what was going on. Thank the Lord though that Troy did not have a weapon and was wildly unprepared to have a madman tackle him in the dark. As it turned out, he had done hundreds of burglaries and never been caught. Jim had the upper hand and had him fully pinned down, and Troy was wisely playing possum. Suddenly, though, we heard a roaring engine and someone laying rubber. Apparently, I started screaming. And yes, it was Troy's getaway driver, his wife, Kelsey. She leaned out of her window and yelled, Get off of him! I'm going to kill you! clearly captured on the audio but I don't remember it. Not willing to wait, she then tried to run me over. I vaguely remember realizing things were going horribly wrong but desperately trying to read the license plate onto the phone with an idiotic laser's focus. It was out of state and I struggled to read it and that was pretty much it. My brain deleted how close she had come to turning me into bloody my brain deleted just how close she had come to turning me into a bloody smear, within maybe a foot of me I guess, fast, while I dodged like a badly clothed metador clutching my phone. 
We had to listen to the 911 recording a year later in the persecutor's office, synced with the video. The video was from a nearby business with really good exterior cameras. Jim started crying and he had no idea what a close call it was. The engine revving overwhelmed my screaming at a certain point. My voice was blown out. I was trying to chant the license number like an incantation, but you cannot hear it because the engine roar and the squealing tires were so loud. Jim let Troy go, of course. Troy jumped into the car and they tore off down the street. The police showed up a minute later, but they were gone by that point. Anyway, Troy had bled all over Jim from the door glass. Jim freaked out so hard later. We figured Troy was likely using IV drugs, correctly as it turned out, and I had to inspect Jim for cuts using a flashlight to make sure I missed nothing. He still got tested though. Unlike a number of other incidences, this one was taken pretty seriously due to the amount of evidence as well as violence and, you know, the attempted murder and all that. Several months later, they arrested Troy and Kelsey. They had Troy's DNA from the bloody clothes Jim was wearing and all over the car that they'd been driving, which had been stolen but ditched. It turned out they were wanted in five counties for hundreds of commercial burglaries over several years to support their oxy habits, back before the age of Fetty. But we were the only mess up that they had made. They apparently didn't know that we lived on the premises. Kelsey, the wife, flipped on Troy. They accepted a plea for her, much to my displeasure since she was the one that tried to kill me. But at least she ratted him out six ways to Sunday. He refused a plea. He wanted a trial. I would not wish a trial on my worst enemy, though. You get interviewed alone by the defense team. And did you know that they can lie? They sure can. They won't in front of the jury, but one-on-one -on -one they'll eat your soul and pick your teeth with the shards. You don't get a lawyer too, you're on team prosecution. Theoretically I can understand it, but it is utterly maddening. They took me first. They played the 911 tape, second time I'd heard it. They insisted that because I kept saying they're inside, that I was lying and that there was somebody else, not Troy or Kelsey. That I hadn't yet seen the person, so they were a they, which is what I told them adamantly. Then they took Jim, and they told Jim that I admitted that I'd lied, and there was another person inside the building. He luckily laughed and was like, absolutely not, she didn't. Finally, the day before trial, Troy accepted a plea, thank the Lord. I had been having the stupidest meltdown ever. Do I dye my hair something other than purple? I'd just spent $700 on it. What shoes do I wear? I don't have conservative shoes. How can I cover my tattoos? Basically, the most pointless stuff that I could control because that train was rolling on without me. Kelsey got off with probation. Troy was in prison from 2017 to 2020 until he got released early, adjacent to COVID. Kelsey seems to be clean and living a normal life now, remarried with kids and she actually looks happy. I watch her on Facebook sometimes and I do occasionally wish that she was a raging case of hemorrhoids or something though. I guess I'm just not a saint. This story took place in 2020 when I was 18 years old. I lived in a relatively safe neighborhood but my country does have a high crime rate in general, so take that with a pinch of salt, I guess. My dad, he had passed away earlier in the year and I had no siblings, so my mum and I lived alone in our house. The COVID lockdowns were still in place as well, but as certain restrictions were lifted, people were starting to return to work. Between my house and the train tracks was a stretch of empty field, it became a safe, quiet space for me to escape to whenever I needed to get out of the house. I would normally sit there once a day for a cigarette or two, sometimes for a little picnic. My home situation was uh, complicated, I guess, to say the least. And due to the pandemic, I really had nowhere else to go. On this particular day, I went there for a few minutes to smoke, as always. 
I was about halfway through my cigarette when I noticed a young man walking along the train tracks on the other side of the field. He was barefoot and wearing dirty, worn-out clothes. He noticed me and made a hand gesture suggesting that he was asking for a smoke. I should have just left, but as a teenager, I found it difficult to say no to people. I walked across the field and handed him a smoke. He took it from me and I immediately felt uneasy with the way that he was looking at me. He asked me, don't you live in that house over there? And pointed at my house. I avoided answering the question and at this point realized that I needed to leave. I had left from my front gate that day and for him to know where I lived, he must have watched me leave from the back gate before. I told him that I needed to get going. He started insisting on giving me a hug to say thank you and I declined several times. At this point I turned around and started walking away quickly but I didn't get very far. You see he caught up to me and put his arm around my waist. At that I panicked not knowing what to do. All I could think of was that I needed to get away. As I tried to start running he grabbed me from behind and started dragging me toward the row of houses where the views from the road is completely blocked. The fences were high too so no one could see the field from their backyards. We were completely isolated in other words. I was kicking and struggling desperate to get out of his grasp. He ended up throwing me on the ground with him on top of me still holding on. In a split second my life flashed before my eyes too. That feeling that something terrible was about to happen came over me. I couldn't escape. He was too strong. My arms were trapped by his and he was holding me down so I couldn't kick him. So I did the only thing left to do. I started screaming for help. Suddenly, I was free. I could move. He had let go and jumped off of me. He ran away and my heart was still pounding. I was shaking in shock from what had just happened. He disappeared into the industrial area on the other side of the train tracks. I immediately ran towards the road and as I reached it, I noticed that it was empty. There were no cars parked in my neighbor's driveways, no one heard me screaming and had he realized that, that day could have had a far worse ending. He knew where I lived and I was terrified of him returning obviously. For months I had panic attacks and nightmares and I could barely leave my house without breaking down. I moved away from there a year later but I still sometimes get scared when I'm home alone or walking around town. Thankfully I never saw him again and I really hope that I never will. So this morning around 4am... I woke up, which is very unusual of me to wake up this early, and saw a large, I'd say about 7 foot tall looking figure in front of my mirror looking at me. For reference, my bed is on the side of my wall and next to it is my mirror and makeup cart. But this figure seemed to be staring directly at me but when I turned on my lamp that's next to my bed, it basically just evaporated and disappeared. Sharing this makes me doubt myself, but I honestly know what I saw. It's been giving me a lot of anxiety and I just wanted to know if this is anything that I should look into or if anyone knows anything about something like this. It spooked me pretty bad and I wasn't able to go back to sleep. I 110% believe in paranormal activity, ghosts, etc. And so this gave me an extra spook. To add on to this as well... I stay home by myself a good amount of the time and I've also been hearing tapping in the walls, bumps downstairs. Sometimes I'll hear the occasionally shuffling sound down the hallway. I looked it up but didn't get many answers so this is my last resort to try and see if anyone can help me out. Oh and uh, also I feel I should mention that in my house we turn on the heat when we go to sleep and my room ends up being pretty hot because it's upstairs. And when I woke up, I was shaking because of just how cold I was. This is very unusual because, if I'm being honest, I usually wake up sweating a bit. 
I was the last one to fall asleep, and when my house is asleep, we're dead asleep, so no one really would have turned the AC on. This morning as well, the same thing happened. I woke up at around 4. I woke up facing my wall, so I turned over to check the time on the phone, and I saw the exact same figure standing in the same spot. I had the blanket over my mirror, and I thought that that would help, but it didn't seem to. I'm getting pretty worried though and I'm thinking that I should probably do a cleanse of my room or even my house. But again, if you have any better ideas then please do share. I'm an American and me and my ex were traveling down a simple highway in the countryside of Scotland. The highway that we were on, A82 I believe was situated in between Loch Ness and a forest. It was a narrow, winding road in a remote area. There had been nothing around for many miles, including other vehicles. We were both in a, a good mood, listening to a podcast or news radio, in a happy space like being on autopilot. Anyway, as we rounded a corner, an old woman appeared seemingly out of nowhere, and she appeared to be screaming at us and gesturing exaggeratedly toward the other side of the road. We were shocked to see her, obviously, and my ex tensed up but didn't react or expect to adjust our lane quickly, and we realized that we were driving on the wrong side of the road. No sooner than we switched lanes and we made it to the next bend in the highway, an 18-wheeler came hauling butt around the curve. Had we had not moved over, we definitely would have been dead on the spot. After we made it through this moment, we debriefed. My ex is a devout skeptic, and neither one of us had an explanation. And we never really spoke of it again. The old woman had shoulder-length grey hair, and I don't remember what she was wearing, but... She looked plain, outside of her appearing sort of spontaneously like that. I really do not have a logical explanation of where she could have come from. I doubt that Scotland employs a special fleet of feral woodland traffic grandmas too, so there's that. This happened about 10 years ago now when I lived in Boston with my husband. I had totally forgotten all about it, but something that I read today reminded me of it, so I thought that I would share it. We lived in this old, terrible building in Jamaica Plains. It was our first place out of college, and it was cheap. That's all that mattered at the time, too. The building was one in a row of other apartment buildings that had separate entrances, but shared a common roof and basement. So you could enter one building, walk down to the basement, and access the basement of the other buildings too. Yeah, not very safe, right? Anyway, the shared laundry room for the three to four buildings was in the basement, and I hated being down there. It was cold and always had that eerie fluorescent lighting with one or two lights flickering that just made you depressed. Most of the other residents were college students and were at class during the day, I worked nights back then, so I used some of the daytime hours to do laundry, since the laundry room was pretty empty at that time. Luckily on this day, my husband was off from work too, so we were just sort of hanging out, taking breaks from watching Netflix and cooking to go down there and load up the machines and all that. When we went down there to get our last load from the dryer, it still had a few minutes left, so we decided to wait for it. While we were talking... This man speed walked into the laundry room. I was sitting on top of one of the broken machines at this point, and there was a list of don'ts on the wall that said not to do that. So at first, I thought that he was coming to give me a hard time about it, but then I noticed that he was really sort of disheveled looking. His clothes were dirty, he hadn't brushed his hair or shaven for a long time, and he looked like he was definitely on something. He came up to me, and held out this large piece of colored craft paper and said, you need to have this. I took it and looked down at it. It looked like something that kids would make at Sunday school or 
maybe something that would be posted on a, a pinup board at a church and listed the Ten Commandments. Well, six or seven of them anyway, because it had been ripped. His eyes, though, looked totally crazed, massive pupils and bloodshot, and he was looking at my body in a really creepy way. He was either on a ton of something or was having a mental episode. Who knows, maybe both even. He seemed like he was waiting for me to say something back and getting a bit impatient about it, but I didn't exactly know what to say. My mind was just sort of stuck in reboot, I guess. I was trying to think of a rational reason why he would give a stranger a piece of craft paper with some commandments on it, but there probably wasn't a rational reason, right? My husband eventually broke the silence, though, and said, Hey man, thanks. That's great. The guy seemed satisfied with that, mumbled something under his breath, and went out of the laundry room and back into the connecting hallway. Once he was gone, we got our laundry, went upstairs, and we called the landlord. She called the cops, but once they got there, they couldn't find him. I highly doubt that they searched all the floors of the buildings, but he could have just left, so I don't really know. I also don't know if he would have hurt me if I was alone, but I definitely wouldn't have defused or handled the situation as easily. Needless to say, though, I never went down there alone again. Earlier this year, my husband went through a terrifying, life-threatening thing, and not to go into any details, but at the point of this story, he was still in bed, bedbound in fact, and we were staying at my parents' house. Now, some relevant background first. My parents' house is big, two floors plus, and a rooftop apartment, and a basement. It's pretty old though, and needs something fixed every other month or so. My dad is very old school and he deals with people he likes, even if they overcharge him. He's been using the same plumber for years, for instance. Same electrician, same gardener, etc. This happened back in my home country, Jordan. The country is mostly Muslim, but my family is Christian. So, we wake up that day and the whole kitchen is flooded. My dad had recently got a new water filter installed and it was giving them trouble since the beginning. My dad had to leave, but he called his water filter guy, which is really specific, I know, but to come and fix whatever was going on. Water filter guy said that he'll be there in a couple of hours, but about an hour later, the doorbell rings and my bro opens the door. It's a man in a suit with a little briefcase. My brother thought that it was one of the doctors for my husband, so he immediately invited him in. The man then corrects him and says that he's not a doctor, that... He's apparently there for the water filter. My mum knows the water filter guy and this wasn't him, but she just assumed that the original guy just sent this guy ahead instead. So my mum asks what he needs. I'm in and out of this whole situation as I care for my husband, but the man goes to the roof to look at the water tanks and he took pictures. Came back down and sat in the kitchen with my mum telling her what he thinks the issue is tanks need replacing and how much they'll cost and all that. So my mum calls my dad and passes the phone to the man who gives my dad the rundown. And then my dad says that he'll talk to his original guy about the price. The man then starts arguing with my dad on the phone to the point that my dad basically yells at him and hangs up. At this point my mum kind of apologetically asks him to leave and that my dad will just talk to his boss because that's what he prefers. The man says, what boss? She tells him his name and the man says that he's never heard of that guy before in his life. Now, my mum is freaking out. She asks who sent him and he says nobody. So she asks him how much she owes him so she can quickly get him out of the house. He says that he noticed the man in the hospital bed and his only payment is that he's going to ask God to heal him. And then he left and... That was it. My dad's actual guy showed up a little later and fixed the filter in the end. But my mom and I were shook by the whole thing. We talked about it in detail for hours. We talked to my dad and my dad's guy and the nurse that was there that day and my brother who opened the door and none of us could figure out how this happened or who this guy was. 
This man just showed up to check water filters on the same day the water filters burst, but didn't want any compensation. Nobody sent him? Like, how, right? It still bugs me, and I mean, my mum thinks that he's a freak or a demon, or... I just don't know. I was going through a lot at that time, so I don't recall everything in absolute detail, but... I'm wondering if anyone else has ever experienced anything like this. And if so, do you have any suggestions, help, or any ideas as to what we should do about it? Oh, and uh, my husband is doing much better, thankfully. He's about 90% recovered and still healing a bit, but otherwise, we're all doing okay, I guess. I had a friend in middle school, early 2000s, whose family lived in a very large home that was a bed and breakfast in the late 1800s to early 1900s. In the Prohibition era, the house had a ballroom or a sort of bar thing on the second floor that was only accessible through a waist-high door in the closet that had to be crawled through. Unfortunately, there was a fire in the ballroom and due to the small door, many didn't make it out alive. The door inside the closet that led to the ballroom still exists and I've seen it, but behind the door is now just drywall and the exterior of the home. I encountered things in this house often. My friend would mention that the spirits were most active while I was there too. We would hear or feel things often, footsteps descending the stairs when nobody was home, a sudden cool of rush air when no windows were open, etc. There was even one room in the house that her dog just refused to go inside of, which was a bit weird. But the most intense experience that I had in this house is a distinct memory that sticks with me still, 15 years later. So my friend and I were in her bedroom, getting ready for our track meet. This was broad daylight, around 3pm. We were doing our hair looking into a mirror, and the bedroom door was behind me and to my right, when I saw something out of the corner of my eye, and when I turned, I swear to you that I saw a woman with her hair slicked back into a low bun wearing a pink sort of puffy sleeved gown. She was peering around the corner at us from the door and looked surprised when I saw her, eyes wide but curious. She was pale and sort of opaque, and at the sight of her I screamed and jumped onto my friend, and when I looked back, the woman was gone. When I finally calmed down and explained to my friend what I had seen, she went pale and explained that a few nights prior, while she was washing her face in the bathroom, she reached for her hand towel and saw a pink blur rush along the open doorway when she opened her eyes. She wasn't totally sure that the event was related, but the fact that I had seen something and she had, had us both a, a bit creeped out. This experience is the one that solidified my belief in the afterlife, actually. Ghosts and the paranormal. It's something that I just cannot forget. So, I was at a friend's house a, a little while ago now. You couldn't really call it a party, I guess, but there were a few people there and it was a sort of social setting. A gathering may be a better term, I suppose, but I'm really not good at these things and never really have been. The effort that I have to go to to maintain my social graces is quite uh, exhausting for me. The majority of time I just sort of tend to avoid them, I guess, but I would have been around 19 at this time. But there were around 8, maybe 9 people there, and it was a mixture of men and women. I guess we've all been to them at one point or another, right? One of the women that was there was kind of new agey, believed in the goddess, crystal healing, all that stuff. Which I'm not rubbishing, but in the 90s, to some, this was definitely a fad. So as the night wound on, she suggested that we did a Ouija board session. Now, I may or may not have mentioned this before, but... I'm third generation Romanian and I was brought up in a family that respected the old ways. So if you know, then you kind of know what I'm talking about with that. And in this kind of situation, I'm heading for the door pretty quickly. 
My friend whose party it was stopped me though and kind of placated me, told me that I was just being silly and he actually did rubbish what the woman believed in and said that it was a joke. So in the end I stayed. But that, as it turned out, was a huge mistake. All around in a, a lot of respects in the end actually. So I was sat at a distance from the table where they convened. She was sat with the planchette asking if there was anyone there. People were smirking and generally just sort of disrespecting the entire thing. She kept asking for signs or if anyone was there and that's when I started feeling uncomfortable. You ever get that gut feeling that you're just being watched or followed? It was sort of like that, like an itch behind your ear. Your scalp tingles and you get a feeling like you need to be moving. It's an instinct bred and hardwired into you over thousands of years and generations. And then the planchette starts moving and she's smiling and all happy that it works and she obviously doesn't look like a clown. So then they start asking simple questions. Will I be rich? Will I be famous? Answers are all no, nothing unexpected. Until a guy asks if he'll be married, then it spells out never. So he asks why and it spells out die young. All of a sudden things take a turn as well. And at that, I tell her to put it down and send it back. She obviously didn't understand what I was telling her to do and the thing is spelling car accident. He laughs it all off and goes and stands in the kitchen. And in the meantime, one of the women asks if she'll have kids. It spells out never. Now my instinct is telling me to leave and I'm listening to it. I go and grab my coat and as I'm leaving, the woman doing the board calls out, your granddad has a message for you. I stopped, walked back in and calmly said to her, you have no idea what you're doing. You're a child with a box of matches and whatever is talking to you is not my granddad. I smashed the board off the table and stormed out at that. And in the years that passed, that guy was actually killed in a car accident with three other people. He was 23. The woman never did have children, and some of the other things, mainly the malicious stuff, did come to pass. I don't know what it was that that stupid woman called in that flat that night, but what I will say is this. Do not play with things that call out to the dead, and if you do, make sure that what you call was human once because... You never can be too careful. That message from my granddad, I never did hear it. And the woman that did the board, I never did see her again. When I was a child, I lived in a very distressing environment. My father, although not violent, was extremely manipulative and verbally abusive to me and my mother. My mum did the best that she possibly could of shielding me from the damage that he did to those around him. But still, it left me with terrible anxiety and depression from a young age. Now, I remember multiple instances where I hallucinated distressing things, but none of them were truly unexplainable, I guess. When I was four, my doctor prescribed me a high dose of prescription strength Benadryl that is not suitable for children. I theorize it is because of this that the first night I took them, I hallucinated a writhing, slithering carpet of spiders covering the floor. Needless to say, my mum never took me back to that doctor and began taking me to actual specialized pediatricians. Later in my life, at the age of 10, I experienced sleep paralysis too. I don't remember much of it, but I remember seeing shadow people staring at me from the darkest parts of my room. Despite these encounters, only one is truly unexplainable to me. No medication, no sleep paralysis, nothing. So one night when I was six years old, I couldn't sleep. This was pretty normal for me, but this time I felt as if I was being watched. At some point, maybe an hour or so into the night, I got thirsty. I still felt as if I was being watched, but at the time I did not think these fears were rational as my anxiety often mimicked this feeling. I walked into the hallway and immediately felt a, an immense drop in temperature. 
This wasn't completely unusual though, as my room was far better insulated than the rest of the house. I continued making my way to the kitchen to get a glass of water, but stopped as soon as I saw it. Now, the living room was directly next to the kitchen and they were separated by one thin wall, so you could see the kitchen and living room from the hallway. And in the middle of the room, standing in the center of the room, was a massive humanoid shadow creature. It was extremely skinny and roughly nine feet tall. It had to bend over to fit under the ceiling. It had a face that was constantly smiling. In fact, the face was the only part of it that wasn't completely pitch black. It stared at me too, smiling as I stood there completely unable to fathom what I was looking at. And then it waved. That's when my survival instincts finally kicked in. I spun around and ran as fast as I could back to my bedroom. I couldn't hear it move, but I could feel it getting closer to me. I slammed my door shut as I got to my bedroom and immediately slid under my bed. I watched the crack under the door from under my bed, unmoving. I watched as its feet stood at the door before it slid under the door. It was as if it lost all shape and became a sort of two-dimensional puddle of just pure darkness. This formless puddle approached my bed before the creature went back to what it was before and stood in front of my bed. It then reached its hand under the bed and wrapped its fingers under the foot of the bed and I could only watch in horror as its eyes and smiling mouth poked out under the bed. I screamed as loud as I possibly could and as I did this, a few seconds later, my mum came bolting into the room. As she opened the door, the creature literally just vanished right before my eyes. I cannot explain what I saw that day, nor can I ask anybody to believe it. But I wanted to put it out there somewhere and I figured that this would be a good place to tell it. Also, something that I do remember is that after I got out from underneath the bed... The bed had clearly moved from its original spot. I jogged to my local village play area to do some pull-ups because I hadn't done any exercise today and wanted to go at night when it would be empty, or well, so I thought. It's night time and freezing and dark so the village is totally dead and quiet. The park is one of the few places that has a street light nearby, which is why I go there. When I got there, I could see outside the park, two figures, illuminated, sort of standing by the bench, completely motionless. I thought that they were maybe dog walkers or something. I couldn't see a dog though. I did my pull-ups quickly and when I looked at them again, they were both still there and still completely motionless. No reaction to me or anything it seemed. In fact, it was so still it was weird. When I looked closer at them, I could tell one was a man in grey and the other a woman in pink. I could see the details of their clothes, but the weird part was their faces. They had no features. Totally smooth skin like Slenderman or something. My eyesight is pretty good and... I thought that if I could make out their buttons on their coats, I should be able to see their eyes or noses or something, but they just looked like a skin-colored circle. Again, too, they were just standing there like statues while I looked at them. I felt like they could see me, too, so I didn't do another set of pull-ups, and I began to run quickly away back home. I looked back a couple of times, and when I did... I could see that they had moved, and they seemed to be heading in my direction. But the weird thing was that whenever I looked back, they were still as a statue again. I went the long way home after that, trying to avoid them by going through back roads to lose them and whatnot. I eventually got home, and that was that. I don't know what to think about all of this, though. Was it just mind tricks? Ghosts? Demons? I've come at night before and it's always been empty, but it just felt off today and then I saw whatever that was. What do you think? So 
the year was 2018. Me and three other friends, we were all males in our early 20s, decided to travel to Bali for about a week since it was cheap and we had time, so why not? Our itinerary includes sightseeing, trying local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at the beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience too. The country is absolutely beautiful and the food was amazing. But the only issue that I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were really prominent there, especially shrooms. The streets were filled with users dying to sell us their drugs. I'm not exaggerating when I say this too, but one dude even grabbed my arm because I ignored his two for one deal for a one way trip to meet Jesus apparently. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed it off suggesting that I may be passing up a chance to meet our lord and saviour. He looked rabid and frantic like he was about to pounce onto me like a dog diagnosed with rabies or something. I didn't feel too afraid as we were confident that we could handle them since half of them were not even sober but that is only the tip of the iceberg let me tell you. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. You see, we had an early day the next morning and were pretty exhausted. The place was extremely cheap and didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors which sort of swung inwards and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock but it got the job done I suppose. Everything was going well too until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was now missing. We looked everywhere for it too, but to no avail. I just figured that one of us must have misplaced it somewhere. We settled for using a selfie stick. I know it sounds like a horrible idea. Instead, since we didn't have anything that fit the hole to wedge the door close. Well, we turned in for the night, seemingly not expecting anything since we had already stayed there for six days with no issues. But I woke up to a strange clicking sound in the dead of the night... I got out of bed and I thought maybe it was one of the guys so I sort of nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping so I decided to investigate the cause of the noise and the ruckus seemed to be coming from the door so I headed towards them feeling extremely confused. I mean who could be at our doorstep at this time of the night? I noticed the doors were slightly opened and the selfie stick was horribly deformed at this point. I peeked outside and that was when I saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance and were attempting to push the doors open. I instantly yelled at them questioning their intentions as I noticed one of them was holding the wooden block. I was shocked and puzzled at the situation as I recognized one of the men. He did the overall cleaning for the Airbnbs and pathways during the day so... There was really no reason for him to be there at 3am. The other dude asked if the wooden block belonged to us as they allegedly found it outside of our Airbnb. I definitely smelt lies at this point as there was absolutely no reason to do that at 3 in the morning. I called for my guys and the three men immediately ran for it at this point. I clue in the guys on the circumstances and we stayed up until morning just in case they tried anything funny. We decided to report this to the reception though about their employee but the description that I gave them, they apparently were not synonymous with theirs. They told me that the housekeepers that they hired consisted only of females in their late 30s and 40s. This instantly sent shivers down our spines as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost and we got out of the situation safely, but that does beg the question, why didn't they steal anything? I must admit that I was grateful that it was our last night there because I really don't know how I would have gone spending another night in that place. I was 16 when this first happened and it occurred around January just after Christmas. My family went on vacation and they left me in the house with my dad. 
and my mum and sisters were on vacation with my aunts. We didn't hire a house sitter to watch over the house because of previous house sitter robberies, so me and my dad and I were the only ones left home. It was Thursday, maybe around 9 o'clock. I liked staying up at night, plus my dad wasn't home, his work shift was extended. But it was at around that time that something weird happened. I think it was around 9.30 and I recall that my dog was scratching the door so I fixed his collar and walked him out to do his business while watching him. And I remember seeing a vaguely strange man walking through the suburban streets and at first I didn't really mind him and was back to doing my business but at around like maybe 9.45, 15 minutes later, I was going back inside when I saw another man walking again while closing the door. He seemed to be walking a bit more slowly and if I can recall correctly, I think it was the same man walking from before. So after I took care of my dog, I was planning to go to sleep. But something about me seeing that guy just, I don't know, it got to me and kept me up. So instead I decided to stay up until 10 to see if he would come back but really didn't see anything at that time so in the end I just went back to going to sleep. At around 11 or 12 though, something like that, I just randomly woke up to my dad calling me. He was wondering if I was still awake and of course I wasn't. I was a little bit irritated because I was already asleep and why would he call at such a time as this but... While we were talking, my eyes slowly turned over to the window, and there he was, the same man again, but he was just standing there, leaning at the lamppost, and I think now he was smoking. When I rubbed my eyes, I saw that it was the same man from before, so I was a little bit surprised, but I didn't tell my dad about the man on the phone. After the convo, though, with my dad on the phone, I went downstairs to peek if the front door was locked. It was, but I just felt a little bit uneasy at the time. I went back upstairs and peeked through my window. The man was still there staring, looking at the house. And I could feel that he knew that I was staring at him. I didn't go back to sleep too because of that. I had a bad feeling, so I grabbed the baseball bat that my little brother was using for baseball practice and kept it beside me. I was stressing out like anything at that time and was shaking softly, but I wanted to call 911, but I was afraid that I'd only waste my time by reporting something that I don't really have clear evidence on. And right at that moment, I can still remember that day too, when he started to brisk walk up to my house and I immediately just jumped up and went into fight or flight mode. I raced downstairs to stay there and when I heard the knocks, I immediately called my dad and told him to check his ring doorbell camera and he saw the man too. He was a little confused at first and thought that me and my friends were pulling a prank on him but when he started knocking, I just hung up on him and started going back downstairs carefully when I arrived at the front door. I stood there holding the bat really tight and asked who was there. He then spoke and... He said that he was a, a solicitor for, I don't know, some solicitor from some place. But I mean, who knocks at like 12 in the morning? So I asked him to get away from our property kindly, but he just wouldn't leave. After a few minutes, my dad sent me a screenshot of the man at our front door and in full caps said, who is that? I just ignored the message. I was guarding the front door. He started knocking on the door more vigorously and aggressively and I clutched the bat ready to swing. I heard another notification on my phone. I checked later and it was my dad saying that he was coming home to check on me. But the man at that moment started kicking on the door and it was aggressive. I tried telling him to leave angrily but he ignored it and kept on continuing. After a few seconds he stopped and I checked my upstairs bedroom window and see that he was sprinting away from the house and saw headlights entering the driveway. I was struck with relief when I saw my dad coming out of the pickup. After that, he called 911 and told them about the incident and hung up. We posted his face on social media for awareness, but 
in the end, that's really all that happened. The guy never returned, thankfully, but still, the whole thing definitely had me shook up for quite some time. So, things have gotten a bit crazy with my girlfriend's sleeping problems. I've been seeing this girl a, a little under a year. It's a great relationship. I think I'm going to marry her, in fact. But she sleepwalks, and I always find her standing at the door. Not going in it or not, just standing still there. She also has a four-year-old son who I adore, and vice versa. But honestly... He has woken up at 2.11 on the dot the past month every single night, crying and wanting to come into bed with us. One night, he woke up screaming and crying worse than normal. He will always stand at the threshold of our door crying for one of us to come and get him. And he will not cross the threshold under any circumstance unless we physically come and pick him up. Side note too... We leave the room open all day and he is in and out of there all day, so it's a bit strange. But anyway, the other night, he woke up at 2.11 like usual. But the only difference is, when I picked him up to lay with us, he claimed that there was a man in the corner. I checked, even though I could see that there wasn't. I did it to comfort him because I could see the said corner and tell that there was nothing there. But then he insisted that we go out of the room until the man in the corner was gone. The whole time he had a look of terror on his face and I just have no idea what to do about any of this. Also, a couple of times I've woken up to my girlfriend pointing at the corner of the room. I don't know if the two things are related but it seems a, a bit fishy, that's for sure. I, a 25-year-old female, work graveyard shift at a nursing facility. It's essentially a residential home for those who are nearing the end of their life, who've gone into transition or are in hospice. The first place I've ever worked where it feels so incredibly alive, despite the residents being so close to the end. But when I first started, I saw things before I heard about it. On my first night... I saw a shadowy woman's silhouette pass behind my co-worker who was talking to me and disappear into the closed bathroom door. In front of the bathroom door is the main exit way, which is wired with an alarm that you need a code to get into. The door itself is heavy too. Think the automatic doors you see in the hospitals. The door alarm was tripped at around 2am, so thinking that a resident might have wandered... We ran from the nurse's station to reset the alarm and get them back into bed. Except when we got there, the door was wide open and the alarm shut off once we got close to it. We did a head count and every single resident on that floor was asleep and accounted for. We eventually were able to laugh about it until the next morning first shift came in and warned me about the uninvited guests that stay on campus. Since then, I've had a plethora of experiences there. The most common phenomena is the man in black and the woman in white, as well as the kids in the courtyard. Apparently, the man in black is a benign thing and he usually pops up at around the time that people are about to expire. Our lead nurse thinks that he guides people to the afterlife and takes away the good ones. Then there's the woman in white. She's apparently of some evil origin. Certain residents who are about to expire report that they see her in their rooms, days leading up to their expiration. They say that her presence is accompanied by a feeling of being set on fire or burning, and there's a theory that this woman in white drags you to whatever the bad place is in the afterlife. One of our hospice patients passed away very recently, in fact, and just before she did... One of our nurses reported that she felt a, a tall, dark, shadowy figure come up close behind her. When she turned her head, there was nothing there, so we can only hope that the patient went to the good place with the man in black. I have many more stories, 
Mostly I need to tell them so that I can finally put them out of my mind and possibly get some input on what this activity could be, but I'll save those for another time. For now, this will have to do. A few years ago, I was at the grocery store and I had finished up and was walking down the center aisle toward the checkouts at the front. Up ahead, standing in the middle of the aisle with his back to the display, facing the produce, was an older man. Normal looking, normally dressed, maybe 60-ish I would guess. Looked like he was just standing there waiting for someone too. I looked at him as I walked toward him and he slowly turned his head toward me. And I swear that he had completely solid black eyes. Even the whites of the eyes where they should be. I instantly felt this immense fear and dread. I turned my cart to the right and started running down the aisle behind the greeting cards, like seriously running. I was terrified because it just did not look natural. He didn't do anything, didn't move, just looked at me, but I eventually made it up the front checkout and left. I had never before or since experienced something like that and I'm 45 now, especially that feeling of dread that I got. I mean, I'm a people person. I probably look like a dork walking around the grocery smiling at people, but hey, that's just me. And if he had been normal looking, I would have smiled and said hi. I've only ever found a couple of stories online that were somewhat similar. Lots of stuff about children with black eyes, but not adults. The story that I've seen about the guy at the rest stop was most similar to what I experienced, especially the dread. And I'm just wondering, has anybody else experienced something like this? Or are there any diseases or anything that could have caused something like this? If you have any ideas, then I would love to hear them. When I was around 15, me and my friends were driving around going to all the haunted places around the Uinta Basin. It was getting close to Halloween, so as is tradition, but we were all trying to scare each other like we always did. First, we went to a place called the Haunted Woods. This is an actual business, not a place in the woods. Then we went to an abandoned hotel near the Ute Reservation. Nothing of significance happened there. We didn't see or hear anything and... We were just sort of goofing around and having a bit of fun. Then the driver says that we're going to Skinwalker Ranch. Now, I had never heard of Skinwalker Ranch before this, but I had heard plenty of stories of Skinwalkers. I was intrigued at first, but as we dropped down the hill back behind the property, I don't know, a, a feeling of dread settled on me like a, a heavy blanket. Everyone in the car got more and more quiet, like they were feeling the heaviness too. I don't think we should go there. I spoke softly. Oh, we're going, the driver announced. There's no moon tonight and no flashlights allowed, he continued. I'll just stay in the truck then. I have a really bad feeling about this and I don't want to go. I spoke again. You are not staying in my truck alone. Now get out, he said rudely. I got out of the truck and looked over at my best friend. Her face was white and her eyes were wide and round and I knew that she felt the same way that I did. We really shouldn't be here. The driver of the truck said that this was the back end of the huge ranch. I wouldn't have believed him that this really was Skinwalker Ranch if I didn't feel that it was in every nerve ending of my body. He walked over to what looked like an ancient post and pole fence undid the loop of wire holding up a small gate and laid it on the ground. There was an overgrown two-track road leading up into the darkness and we followed as he led us up it. The horrible feeling of dread was almost overwhelming at this point and I felt like I was about to be sick. I wanted to go running back to the truck but I had a deep fear that something would pounce the moment that I left the safety of the group. But we weren't laughing and joking here anymore. That heaviness was weighing on all of us now and we walked silently through the dark. As we walked, I tried to keep my eyes on my feet but I would occasionally glance to either side of the two-track road. Each time I did, 
I would see a huge black mass out in the tall grass that I could have sworn was moving. I told myself that it must just be a cow, but each time that I looked at it, it was in the same spot off to the left following our journey to the old homestead. Finally, the driver and the leader of our ghoulish expedition stopped and said that we were almost to the old homestead and that we needed to stay quiet in case the owners were around. As he turned to start walking again, a growl leapt from the darkness and he stopped and took a step back. He wasn't our fearless leader anymore. His voice shook as he told us that it was time to head back to the truck. We walked a little ways and then one of our group said that they needed to use the bathroom. We stopped by a small stream running along the south end of the property. I was smoking and talking to one of my friends about how relieved I was that we were finally leaving. I glanced down at the stream at the same time my friend did, just in time to see a black figure emerging from the water. It was not a cow. It was not a coyote either. It looked like it was way too skinny and too tall. We both screamed and ran back on the road and that was the last straw for everyone. But we all ran the entire way back to the truck at this point. Now, a few months later, this adventure had slowly left my mind. I had started to convince myself that the figures in the darkness, they were just cows and that it probably was just the dark running water playing tricks on my eyes, making me see things emerging from the water that weren't really there. My best friend had come over to my house to sit outside and mess around a bit, smoke some cigarettes and whatnot. We did this pretty frequently at this point. We lived in the middle of nowhere, so dumb things like this were about as much fun as we could have. So we're just sitting in her car, just across the road from my house. Her car is pointing towards the town park, which was just about a block away from my house. There were no other houses on the way to the park, so with the street lamps on at the park, you can basically see everything up there. Oh, look, a deer, my friend says suddenly. I could see a a set of glowing eyes now on the very far end of the park. Oh yeah, there it is, I reply. We watch as it slowly walks towards the center of the park. In this spot is a huge metal slide or jungle gym thing. It's probably about 10 to 12 feet, I would guess. But as this deer is walking, I notice that for some reason I can't make out any features of the deer. It seems to almost always be just out of reach of the street lamps that are dotted throughout the park. The deer is right next to the slide when suddenly it stands up. The eyes that were watching are suddenly even with the platform of the slide, which would make this deer at least 10 to 12 feet tall. Then it seems to start walking on its hind legs. Me and my friend, we both start panicking. That is not a deer. We keep watching this extremely tall creature cross the park when my friend decided that we're driving up there. She locks the doors and we head towards the park. When we're almost there, the eyes had now crossed the street and went into the neighborhood across from the park. And by the time that we actually got to the location, whatever was there, it had vanished. Another few months go by, the event had definitely rattled us and there was no convincing ourselves that it was a deer at this point. I mean, deer do not walk on their hind legs like that and they're definitely not 10 feet tall. One night though, I'm at the same friend's house. This friend lived smack dab in the middle of a huge farmland. All around her were pastures and it was really peaceful most of the time. We had spent the night watching movies and hanging out. I went and started my car and we were smoking together on her porch before I left. But we were just chatting when suddenly her eyes leave my face and look behind me and her eyes grow really wide. I turn to look and see two glowing red eyes just past the fence into our neighbor's pasture. What the heck is that? I managed to squeak out. I don't know, she whispers back. The eyes remained fixed on us for about 30 seconds, then turned to the left, seemed to blink, and vanished. With that, we both ran back into the house and I didn't dare go back home for at least another 45 minutes. If my car hadn't had already been started, 
I probably wouldn't have left at all, to be honest. Now, a couple of years after these events, I was speaking with a Ute tribal member that I worked with, and she said something that gives me goosebumps to this day. She told me that it isn't what's on the ranch that you should be afraid of. It's what follows you when you leave that you need to be worried about. I am convinced that something followed us from Skinwalker Ranch, and those terrifying events were something warning us to never go back. I never did, and believe me, I never will. In 2014, I flew from Sydney to Belfast in order to attend the wedding of a business associate's son, with a week of face-to-face -face business meetings following. It was a bit of a nightmare to get there, with the transit through Singapore getting disrupted by Ibis getting sucked through one of the engines as we landed. Despite this though, I managed to get to the wedding just in time. The next day, however, everything caught up with me. The long nights, the major time zone change, and the numerous Bushmills whiskies that I drank at the reception had forced me to delay a meeting and take a nap in my hotel during the middle of the day. I didn't want to stay asleep for too long and risk a sleepless night, so when I woke up after what felt like about an hour, I was keen to get right out of bed and not risk falling back to sleep. Problematically though, I couldn't move. I tried and tried and tried again, putting every bit of willpower into breaking the paralysis. And then I heard a loud bang. This immediately broke the paralysis and quickly I looked up to see one of the large floor to ceiling window panes in my room had shattered into tiny little pieces. Something about it felt very causal as the explosion seemed to happen at the exact same time that I was putting in every bit of effort into breaking this paralysis or whatever it was. It was almost just like how cartoons or movies might depict someone with supernatural powers impacting things around them when they're just really angry or trying to put all their effort into some kind of magical action. Weirdly too, the night before, I was put on a table with randoms at the wedding reception and one of the guys who worked for a window company was there and he mentioned that on very rare occasions, double glazed windows will explode and require replacement. Now, to hear someone talk about exploding windows just the night before and to have one occur in my room less than 24 hours later seems like a, a very bizarre coincidence, right? In any case, I called reception and they were initially very alarmed by what I had reported to them misunderstanding it to be some kind of IED that had gone off. A guy from the hotel then came up and moved me to a new room and explained that people get jumpy around here when you mention explosions due to the troubles. In fact, he explained that the hotel itself had been the target of a bombing many decades ago with a, a number of fatalities. Anyway, I really don't know what to make of any of this, but... It's definitely one of the strangest things to happen in my life. I, a 36-year-old female, grew up in a suburb in LA. We rented a small house that had two bedrooms in the back and a main living space and kitchen up front. My brother had one bedroom and I had the other, while my parents slept in the main living area. Now, when I was about seven or eight, my father and brother were away on a camping trip with the Boy Scouts. Since the boys were away too, my mum and I decided to have a girls' night and stay up late playing games and whatnot. It was probably about one in the morning. Yes, way too late for me to be up, but that's my parents for you. When I went to go and get another board game from my bedroom, and when I stepped into my room... For some reason, I just had the worst feeling of dread just come over me. I'll never forget that feeling too. It still gives me goosebumps when I think about it. I walked over to my dresser where the board games were and where a doll my grandmother had given me was. It was a porcelain doll with a big fancy dress on a little stand, so it looked like she was sort of standing up. And sensing that something felt terribly wrong and perhaps trying to comfort myself... I reached over and pat the doll's dress and said, It's okay, Dolly, or something like that. And as soon as I did it, one of the doll's legs shot straight up in the air. 
I screamed instantly and I ran out of that room. Years later, my mum told me that strange things used to happen all the time while we lived in that house, but my parents would try to hide it from my brother and me. For instance, one time a pan just randomly flew off the stove and they just played it off like it was normal. Cabinets would also randomly be opened, lights would flicker, that sort of thing. We didn't live there much longer, but I never did set foot again in that room. My brother helped me destroy the doll, but looking back, I'm pretty sure that the doll was probably just a vessel for whatever else was living in that house. I've tried to find out the history of the house, but it was destroyed during Katrina, and I'm really unable to find anything out about it. Now, I can be pretty skeptical about these things, but I always go back to that moment and realize that anything can happen. So me and my brother, we shared a room and we were around 10 years old. My bed being on one side of the room and his bed being on the opposite side. It was really dark and I was staring up at my ceiling waiting for that drowsy feeling to creep in. I remember too, clear as day, my bed just bouncing three times, like somebody was underneath my bed and started kicking the mattress from underneath the frame. It was brief and violent, only three times, but I got up immediately and looked at my little brother whose eyes were locked on what was underneath my bed, and he told me that there was something there, and when I went to check, it was just our basketball. The ball, though was bouncing as if it had just been dropped two seconds prior to me checking underneath my bed. And quite frankly, there is simply no logical explanation as to what happened and how. When I'm alone with my thoughts, I think about it and genuinely become stressed about it too. I'm 24 now and I called him recently to see if it was a fake memory, but no, he confirmed that it actually happened and he also had no possible explanations. He also has slight variations though as to what he remembers being that our room wasn't that dark that night because our blinds were open, thus letting moonlight in. He said the space under my bed was unnaturally dark though and he describes it as a, a thick and impenetrable darkness and didn't think anything of it until my bed started bouncing violently. That was when he started staring intently at the space under my bed and said that he saw something. When I was 18, 2005, my mum was giving me a ride to work one day. My car had got impounded for something stupid and I had to wait 30 days to get it back. In the meantime, my mum was giving me rides to work. Now, on Saturdays I worked morning shifts, so I had to be at work by 5am. That means that we had to leave the house no later than 4.30. So, it was still dark outside, like pitch black in fact, and very cold. That morning as my mum drove me to work, from a distance I could see a figure getting ready to cross the road, basically jaywalk in front of us. As we got closer, I could see that it was a young girl, I thought to myself, ah, caught her doing the walk of shame, huh? She had no shoes, a long white skirt like she was wearing a man's white tee. It was really big on her and it looked like she had no pants on, but you could barely see that she had these sort of short jean shorts under her large shirt. Like the kind that used to be pants, but she cut herself to make into shorts. She wasn't wearing shoes too, but... My mum started talking in Spanish, like what kind of girl walks around the streets at this hour dressed like that. She was walking now in the middle of the street too, super slow at that point. My mum had to stop like 10 feet away from her too because she was still in the street, now blocking us. When my mum stopped though, the girl came to a complete stop too, but wasn't facing us. She was facing in the direction that she was crossing, crossing from right to left. And as we now were close, I could see her skin was odd, like a real bluish gray color. Her hair was black and it looked sort of wet as well and tangled like she just got out of a shower. My mum was about to honk at her when she slowly turns her head to look right at us. 
her hair was covering her face and she honestly looked like the girl from the ring for a moment. But the part that I'll never forget was that she moved her hair out of the way and I swear to you that she had no face, like nothing. It was all completely smooth, like Slender Man sort of. No eyes, no mouth, no nose, nothing. It just looked smooth. My mum started to have a panic attack. I literally felt my heart drop. I now was focused on calming my mum down. The girl looked at us for about two or three seconds, and then she took off running. She didn't move at irregular speeds or anything, but she was definitely off now. And quite honestly, I've never seen anything like that in my life. To this day, my mum and I really can't explain what it was. I mean, I guess it could be just a prank or something, but honestly, who would do something like that? I guess I'm just sharing my story as well in the hopes that maybe somebody else has seen something similar. Something with no face. For context, I'm a woman living alone in my apartment. It's located on the ground floor, and so my balcony is very visible to other people. Like every night, I work at 4 in the morning, so I leave at around 3.40 a.m. Unfortunately, in France, they decide to turn off the lights from about 8 p.m. to like 6 a.m., I think. But thankfully for me, the landlord where I live turned on the lights just for me from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m., it's very dim, but I'm thankful for it still. And this Thursday night, I leave like always, go in my car, locked it, turned on my lights, and something caught my eye. So I looked up, and I thought that I just saw a, a cat jumping from my balcony because they love to come by just to look around and leave. But then I took another look, and it was no cat. It was a man standing next to my balcony. I think that the light surprised him and I'm looking at him walking away from me on the grass but he can't leave that way so I'm just sort of staring at him scared and calmly crying not knowing what to do for like 10 seconds but then I see movement again and it's him walking towards me looking at me quickly and then I just continue walking to the main road like nothing happened. He takes one last look at me in my car before I lose sight of him. Also, he was wearing black sweatpants and a camo jacket, which is weird, right? I don't know what he was doing here, if he was sleeping on my plastic sofa on my balcony or I don't know, but I can't help stop thinking about his face looking at me or what would have happened if it was pitch black outside or I don't know. I wanted to make a report to the police, but they said that they can't because there was no damage. The lady also told me, no, but maybe it wasn't for you, and maybe he was looking around for uh, somebody else's dwelling or something. And I said, at this hour and in this outfit? I don't think so. And then she replied, no, I'm talking robbery. And I'm like, yeah, duh, Sherlock. Since then, every night... I run like crazy to my car with a pepper spray in my hand. Also, I bought surveillance cameras on my balcony just to check before going out at night because now I'm super paranoid and I'm kind of developing OCD, I think. I have to look and check outside before going to sleep every night. But, yeah, is there anything else I should do to keep myself safe? A couple of weeks ago, my dad shared this story with me. My dad, for context too, is about as down to earth and grounded as they get. So, him, his then high school girlfriend, his friend with girlfriend in tow, and another male friend would drive out to the back roads. The roads that we're talking about are pretty desolate. You could go through the night without seeing another car there, in fact. But they would randomly stop up and put some tunes on and just do what teens do. This is in the late 70s as reference and one night they stopped and were hanging out when in the field about maybe 500 yards away 
a total of five lights shone spaced about 50 yards from each other and roughly 20 feet off the ground. My dad said that they all just stared because the lights were so brilliant but really didn't hurt their eyes strangely. But roughly 50 seconds after being on they went off without a sound. But they were all discussing what it was when once again the lights came on again. This time they noticed three people standing about 50 yards in front of the lights, just standing, no movement. Lights turned back off. My dad said that they were not scared since it seemed so far away from them. Lights go back on and the initial three people have moved up roughly 50 yards and there is now five more behind them, about 50 yards away. Sort of like a bowling pin arrangement. Lights go back off. At this point, while still kind of watching, my dad and his friends are packing up to nope out of there. The lights come back on and there is the initial eight people still in the same position. But now one single person is about 200 yards away, right in the middle of the light spectrum. That was when they floored it out of there. No one looked back and it was never spoken of amongst the friends. My dad said that it was some sort of a production to spook five high schoolers, he thinks. It was well accomplished, but all of this happened within about a three to five minute period of time, and I had to ask, did you see the lights for a fourth time while driving away, and he said that they were all so shook up that they would not have even noticed, to be honest, because they just wanted to get out of there and did not want to see them again. This is a, a long camping story told by someone who doesn't speak English, so please just bear that in mind as you listen in. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and such. My parents were legitimately afraid for me and were against the idea of going camping. I had to lie to them that we would stay in a hotel near the Kazaya National Park so that they would get off my back. Obviously, that's not what we did though. Long story short, we had to travel from Bucharest to this park, which is around 200 kilometers in maybe two hours by train. We get our immense backpacks, everything that we needed, and we went our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train, except for the fact that the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. That is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I got excited though, thinking that we would have that whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it's a very rare thing to happen. And of course, after maybe 10 to 20 minutes, it was occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German Shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats, dogs in particular though. I usually find my way around all animals too, even those that really don't like people. But not this dog. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stuffed as if it was a stuffed animal almost. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by this, so obviously I start asking the man about his dog, since it would be a long and awkward trip to just sit there in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog though, except the commands that he would give to his dog, no other contribution to the conversation really. He told me that his dog's name is Uchigashul, which in Romanian means the killer. It's a, a very weird name to give a dog because for this particular example, we would use the English word as it is, not translate to the word Romanian and name the dog like that. But I thought to myself, well, each to their own. I asked him why such a scary name and he bluntly replied, the dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing that he likes and he's good at it. Now, I personally consider that the dog will grow up to have a, a similar personality to an owner. And most of the times, I would judge people with dogs on how that animal reacts to the world and to his owner. And let me tell you guys... These two did not give a good vibe in return. I brushed everything over thinking to myself that 
Maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt in the woods or something. When I started thinking which woods are legal to hunt in our country, while I was thinking of that, the guy, out of nowhere, asks if we're traveling to the national park. That was surprisingly accurate too. I mean, he gave the name of it. Considering too that the only time that we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found our seats and way longer before we even met this guy. Again, I thought it was nothing because in my country, people who happen to go in the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you're headed. Of course, you can lie to keep your destination safe or you can be honest if you like. I took the honesty route and am judging myself for that to this day. My advice, never be too honest with strangers or perhaps even honest at all after you hear this. So we confirmed that we were going to that place, asked what else to see around since he started talking about the area and well, considering that we really knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals that we can encounter there, told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we needed to climb to get to, advised us to visit the Latrishore waterfall and explore the caves behind it, and try out the local restaurant too. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a, a pleasant memory, but he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck. Squeezing it tight, the collar made a loud clink sound. And what surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a, a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reach our destination, say our goodbyes, the man waves at us, and we face against him to go on our way. I turned back around the right way because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was, and the man and the dog were no longer there. But not just that, also his luggage was gone. That creeped me out a bit, but I mean, who cares, right? He must have just left. We were too thrilled as well for our first camping experience, so we started walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilos each, and we reach a, a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing too, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if you traveled during the night, would make your hair stand right up. Lucky for us, we traveled during daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel by any means too. I mean, we could see the end by the time that we got to the middle of it. But it was around this time that we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life, so we stop. My boyfriend looks at me with his, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog. I go right towards the sound and in the middle of the road, I see a, a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles on its butt, crying so hard and laying on the cement looking really hurt as if it was hit by a car or something. I freeze and think to myself that, oh no, our trip is over at this point. I have to save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointy ears up, gets up and looks like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph and now he was pretty much our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further, we find another puppy though probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone threw her in the river to try and kill her, we guess. All wet and cold and hungry. And of course, we take her too. So, here we are. Ten kilo backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with map, trying to find a spot to camp for the first night. We passed by the monastery the man in the train mentioned, but because we had these two puppies, we really couldn't enter the inside building. The priests wouldn't allow us anyway, so we just sort of walked around the property through the gardens until we reached the base of the mountain that we had to climb. I would like to mention too that these puppies were two tiny little brats because the second that you would put them down and force them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts on the ground and just begin crying. Just a lot of drama really, but we walk and walk and walk until we decided to stop because it was getting late. 
I was also beginning to get a bit cold. So we found a spot next to a small landmark type of cottage in the middle of the woods. We called it Troyanitsa. It's like a scouting post but for the church where they place religious icons or a bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church, it wasn't like a house or anything. It was basically a roof with four small walls and an opening, not a door. But you could go into it, like hide from the rain and whatnot. There was an icon inside and a bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the bible was really annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it like couples do on trees but on one particular page the words I will find you stuck out it was written in red ink again I thought to myself that it was probably somebody who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages so I put the book back and gave it no second thought we put up the tent make the fire unpack make food and we eat we also feed the puppies, which are now cuddled up in our tent, and finally darkness starts to rise all around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it went off, it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us, which was probably not the case, but anyway, that's what we did. So now, it's around 12am, we are all in the tent cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and they start crying. I get up and I unzip the tent and put them out to pee. They do and then I get them back in. They cry some more and the smallest one starts shivering. At the same time though, I then begin to hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too because he hears this as well. The fire is fading at this point and the moment that he unzips the tent, the steps stop. The sound just disappears and then it sounds like somebody has run into the woods. It almost sounded like a snake though slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground but at unimaginable speed. I ask him, was that a snake? And he says that up to this day he cannot explain what he saw. He says that it was a, a sort of slithery figure with feet that made a, a snort like sound when the light hit it. The puppies... They calm back down after this creature, whatever it was, runs into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's like 3am this time when we wake up and the puppy's being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead. We clearly had no idea how to put up a sustaining fire by the way. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness and... I swear to this day that I hear whispers coming from between the trees. I look up at the sky, considering that it's like 3am, and hear birds being really loud and fluttering their wings. Now, I'm no expert in birds by any means, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, whatever the case, these were not. They were very active, very vocal, and seemed almost very frustrated. I look at the fire and I follow the red sparks popping out of it into the sky and become fascinated with something. The sparks? They don't seem to die off. They just go on and on, changing color from like a, a hellish red to a sort of green color. This was very out of the ordinary because it created sort of an illusion which is hard to explain but it looked as if the sparks were going into the woods, creating a sort of track for me. I kept looking after each spark to see when it would burn out. None of them did. Instead, they just seemed to sort of levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. It was around this moment, too, that I began to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds, they were agitated. The mysterious light was pointing us to go deeper into the woods and all the trees around us seemed to all of a sudden have eyes on them. Like the trunks had a distinguishable shape that looked like eyes. I know that at this point I was probably just overthinking it. I mean, it was nothing paranormal since someone explained that those shapes come from tree branches which are sort of ripped off and sort of create a swirl on the bark. And that's the shape that is left afterward. But there were so many, 
like a hundred eyes, all looking at the exact spot where we decided to camp, having only that religious tiny landmark to mentally protect me now. And as I inspected my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, like 10 meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground, but I don't get near it. Suddenly, though, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it, and half inside the bush and sort of half outside of it, stares at us. I call my boyfriend and we're both like, what the heck is that? Is it a bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature, whatever it was, shakes its head the same way that a dog does after a bath and I hear a distinguishing clink, like a dog collar. At this point, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really big, which scares whatever this is back to run into the woods, through the bushes from which it initially came out. That calms us down a bit, but not enough to ever close our eyes again before that night. We just stayed up and we went back into the tent. My boyfriend eventually fell asleep though. The puppies are also sound asleep, but I couldn't. I kept the zipper on the tent opened a little, just enough to make my eye peek through it, right at the early mentioned bush. I think I must have spent a, a solid hour staring at that bush. When all of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake up my boyfriend, who is now peeking through the hole with me into complete darkness. And what we see next, it still disturbs me. From that exact same bush, we see a human head popping out and looking towards our tent. Note too that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you're being watched from the inside of the tent. And this head is slowly arising out of the bush. The skin's so white that we honestly thought that it was a ghost at first. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, a full torso, a leg, and bit by bit, an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lit up by both the moon and our fire. And what he did next was so terrifying. He comes really close to our tent and begins to remove branches and rocks, etc. from our fire, basically trying to extinguish our fire by dismantling it. This all happened like maybe two to three meters from our tent. And it was at this point that I look at the man with horror because I recognize him. And now that I think about it, the clink that I heard earlier sounded a lot like the one that I heard on the train that day. It was the same man from the train with his dog too. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us. But this guy had been there since 12 a.m. at least, because our fire would be dead every two to three hours and we would be woken up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing the land. After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the bush, submerging into it bit by bit, until only his head would be out of it, with a disfigured look on his mouth, looking like a, a moaning ghost almost. And you can bet that we did not get a wink of sleep after that. We really didn't know what to do at this point but to just go back out and try to reignite the fire, light ourselves some torches and stay near the campfire until the first rays of the sun came up. I was too afraid to go near that distant bush. I didn't need any answers and I did not need any explanations. I just wanted daylight to get the heck out of there as quickly as we could. And as soon as daylight broke, we did. We packed our stuff and we got the heck out of there. We had planned a four day camping trip and this experience made us give up after the first night. It was just a risk that we didn't intend to take. If that guy had followed us or even if it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin everything. As a conclusion to my story and I guess a bit of advice to any first time campers out there, please just be careful about who you tell your location out there to or even areas remotely close to your destination, especially in regards to strangers. We just don't know where their minds might take them and 
what they may end up doing. Always stay safe, always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movements, temperatures and so on. And obviously, always protect yourself. I live in an apartment building that has four apartments on each floor. The apartments are split into two groups by something that we call a bubble. Basically, two apartments share this bubble, and there is a metal door guarding them before each tenant goes to their own doors. Now, my husband works as a doctor, so he had to go to work for his night shift. I usually do house chores when he goes to work, so the house is clean when he comes back in the morning. I turn on the Scary Stories podcast on my Xbox and do my work. I have two cats, Zena, who is five years old, and Marcel, who is three months old, that are usually very playful during the night time. At one point, they both stop chasing each other, and they stare at the door without moving or blinking. Zena, my eldest, having her back curled and silently hisses under the door. She never expresses such behavior. She's really one of the chillest and laid-back cats there is. So, having her react like that made me very curious. At the same time, one of the stories that I was listening to was about home invaders. Also, from the local news, we had been informed how most of the time said invaders will check on houses that they want to break into and learn the owner's schedules and such before trying to break into the home. This obviously made me feel very insecure and so I turned the volume lower in order to hear what was going on on the other side of the door. Which, by the way, it is impossible to get to unless you unlock the first metal door, which is the sole purpose of extra protection for my and my neighbor's apartment. My neighbor is a lonely old lady that has two cats of her own and is, ironically, the building manager as well. It must have been around midnight though and she was most likely sound asleep by this point. I turn the volume to my TV down and I go closer to the door, having Xena still not move from her position, pressing my ear against the door, searching for sounds, but I couldn't hear much, except a, a distinguished sound of a very heavy breathing, like an alcoholic breathing heavily almost. It gave me goosebumps and I immediately started looking around the house for something to defend myself with, in a worst case scenario, thinking that if he broke past the metal door all by himself, then my apartment door might not be much of a challenge for him. I took my husband's baseball bat and I held onto it with my life. I took my cats and hid them in the cupboard under the sink. I don't know why, I just don't have children yet, but this was what just came to mind at first, and went back to the door. I open the peephole and see a person breathing at my door at midnight and my heart sunk to my stomach. All I could see was one eye, a very veiny red and sort of popped out eye staring back at me, followed by repeated and faster breathing as if it knew that I was watching back. I didn't move or make a sound, hoping that it would make the creep go away, but that was not the case. Even when I move back from the door, I see the doorknob move frantically. He was now trying to get inside, murmuring something that I couldn't make out, as if on a frenzy. I freeze, holding the baseball bat to my shoulder, basically preparing myself to bash out this guy's head if he managed to get inside. As he was trying desperately to get inside, fighting with both the doorknob and the keyhole because I could hear noises coming from the keyhole, an idea came to mind. I rush to the living room, which is very close to the entrance door, and blast out scary story podcast sounds, and luckily, the specific story was narrated by a guy with a very heavy voice, and from the outside, it almost sounded like there was someone inside the apartment having a conversation, mostly a, a monologue, I would guess. I live in a country where English is not a native language and few people speak it, but at last, what I prayed would work actually did. The moment that I blasted the volume to max, the doorknob stopped moving, the breathing ceased, and as I went back to the door and checked the peephole for that creepy guy, he was no longer there, but the metal outside door was now wide open.
Well, of course, my neighbor only now wakes up from my podcast basically screaming in my house, asking me to turn it down. I tell her what happened and how come she didn't hear anything. She said that she had her TV on as well as she sleeps with it on, so she doesn't feel alone and she just didn't hear the conundrum going on in the hallway between our apartments. We both examined the metal door, asking each other if we had left it open. Even called my husband at work to see if he did the same thing and he told me that he actually locked it twice as usual. I don't know what I would have done if this expert in door breaking actually managed to break into my house that night. But I do think that he had it out for me and my cats. I never thought of that, of all the possibilities of salvation, that the scary podcast would be the one thing to save my life, but yeah, it was, and it was indirect of course, but still, I'm thankful that that guy didn't get in. This is about a, a bad experience that I had when I went camping on the beach in the summer with my boyfriend. We had the nice idea of camping on the beach instead of going to a hotel since I always wanted to sleep and hear the waves hitting the shore, see the night sky whenever I wanted and just live this experience at least once in my life. We were supposed to stay in our tent for a week. The area had public restrooms with showers and restaurants so the matter of hygiene and hunger wasn't an issue. We bought all the supplies that we needed for such an adventure, a two person tent which was blacked out the sun rays wouldn't come in, an inflatable mattress, a first aid kit, lanterns for the tent, etc, etc. The first nights, too, were really no issue. We actually enjoyed every moment of it. We would always take all of our valuables with us in backpacks in case anything bad would happen to our tent, phone chargers, wallets, stuff like that. We weren't the only people that camped in that area. There were plenty of people that would camp there, either single people, couples, or even families sometimes, which includes even people that behaved badly as well. When nighttime came, you would occasionally hear people laughing, partying, dancing, listening to music and smoking, taking drugs of course, or drinking a lot of alcohol as well. We didn't mind it though as nobody had bothered anyone for the past four days and nights. People were just having fun as they knew best and Nobody was being aggressive or anything like that, so we were all good. On one night, though, we stayed out later than we usually did, around 1am, just wandering around the lively streets to listen to street performers, eating out and such, when we stopped at one of such street performers, who seemed to have a lot of people encircling him and listening to his music. We realized he wasn't the main character, though, that the people were gathered for, because in the middle of the crowded street, where cars would occasionally pass by, was a middle-aged woman dancing completely naked, clearly affected by the abuse of alcohol and or consummation of drugs. She was incoherent though. She would randomly flirt with people. She would expose herself while dancing to the music, despite the disgust of the musician and the passerbyers. We didn't stick around for too long and decided to leave back to our tent and just have a drink in silence while watching the stars and falling asleep to the sounds of the ocean. While drinking ourselves, we would hear some lady shouting in the distance. It was probably the same woman that we had seen before. But she wasn't alone now. She had friends with her. Two women. They had a camp set on the same beach with us a few tents further from us, but not far enough so that we couldn't hear them or see them, even if it was dark. They had a lit fire on the beach and they continued to drink and smoke and dance around it. She of course was still naked, but this time she was wearing a see-through skirt. She goes in the ocean for what seems like an eternity. I remember thinking, how is she not cold? That water must be freezing. And my boyfriend, he just shrugged and told me not to be bothered. If we don't engage with her or them, they really shouldn't annoy us. So I did as I was told, but even so, I always felt as if I was being watched. I put my thoughts aside though. We decided to go to sleep, but being a beautiful night and the air being as warm as it was, we thought of not closing the tent completely, 
Just zip the mosquito cover so the air would circulate inside the tent and have the sun shine in in the morning and wake us up early. Now, I don't really recall how long I'd been sleeping for, but I remember being awoken by footsteps circling our tent, a womanly voice humming a song softly. The tent was not very thick. You could hear everything outside of it. I was too afraid to look out. Heck, I was too afraid to even change my position as to not indicate to the outsider that I noticed their presence. All I did was lay down and look outside through the mosquito cover. All of a sudden, though, I hear footsteps stop above my head and a voice whispering, Don't be afraid. I want to sing you a lullaby. I also noticed that whoever this person was, with the shadow, they had something in their hand, their right hand. And the footsteps, they began to circle the tent. I see her feet in front of our tent passing by, noticing the very familiar long see-through skirt blowing behind her. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night after that, and I just laid there listening. The next morning, we packed our tent and we moved to a different area of the beach, further away as possible from that woman and her friends. In April 2011, a friend and I were stargazing on my roof on a dry, clear night in New Jersey. We were observing the Lyrids media shower that wasn't producing as many shooting stars as we had hoped, but we stayed up there, intensely focused on the sky, to see one every few minutes. After a couple of hours of this, we caught a bright light in our peripherals. We turned around and we see what looks like a bright blue-white LED flashlight traveling into the forest behind the house. At first instinct, we thought that it was the police with a flashlight chasing someone, but then we realized that the light was up in the treetops, weaving through the canopy. All we could do was say, what the heck is that, over and over again as it got closer to us. It was traveling along the direction of the river behind our house and seemed to notice us because... As it passed the back of my house, it slowed to a gentle stop, then took a 90 degree turn onto the clearing of our property, maybe about 40 feet from us coming straight toward us, as if it had noticed us and wanted to check us out. This is when we got our first really good look at it. It was a, a perfectly defined glowing sphere of light, the size of a, a basketball, with what seemed like churning sort of flowing plasma inside of it. I see blue-white hue emitting absolutely no sound at all. We started screaming at this point. As it approached, it moved very slowly compared to the pace that it had been traveling through the trees. It seemed almost cautious in its movement. It's weird, but you could sense some form of intention or intelligence in its movement. We were horrified because we knew nothing could explain what we were seeing. And we weren't about to mess around and find out by letting it get any closer. We scrambled off the roof and ran inside hiding under a blanket like scared little children. Even though we were in our late teens at this point. We didn't talk about it much after that because well, we just really couldn't explain it. About a year later though... One of my neighbors is banging on my door, telling me to let him in. He told me that him and a friend were down by the river in the same patch of woods and were chased by a floating silent light ball. This obviously freaked me out because I assumed that he was telling the truth because I had never told him the story of my encounter. When I was a child, about maybe six to seven at my best guess, I lived in a haunted house. The owner's mother apparently died there and there are rumors that it was used as a drug den before the owner started renting it out. Anyhow, I used to see a gown float by the doorway and I would also have very like demonic dreams for a lack of a better term. Two incidents stand out as potentially demonic to me anyway. Once when I was lying down to sleep, I heard a commanding deep voice say, there's somebody in the house. That's it, no follow-up and nothing else. 
I've never had another incident like that in my entire life. But the second incident was one night when I woke up out of a deep sleep and saw a face on the ceiling. I drew it for my mother and she had me checked out. I was fine. So she instead had the house blessed. And after that, we never had an issue since. But fast forward about two and a half years ago when my first daughter was about to be born. For about two months, I had a reoccurring nightmare where a tall man in a black hat sort of like a top hat but sort of misshapen too would stand at the foot of the bed and just sort of watch me upon waking i would have sleep paralysis for a few seconds and in those moments i could still see and feel him my wife would often wake me up claiming that i was screaming no who are you or other times just mumbling but after my daughter was born i only had one other incident I was rocking her back to sleep in her crib and I saw my wife open the door a crack and stand by it looking in. I asked her to come in but for some reason she didn't move. I said babe and nothing. At the same time I went to the door to open it all the way. I heard her groggy voice from the adjacent bedroom, our room, say, huh, what? I'll never forget it, exactly how it sounded and everything. As the door opened, I had a flash of just white void where a face would be, along with the rest of what I can only describe as a, a figure exactly as tall as I am, I guess. It vanished in a moment, and I ran to my bedroom and sat in bed with my daughter. Every single hair on my arms and neck stood straight up that night, and I've never felt anything so terrifying since then. Now, everything has been fine since that event for years, and here and there random things will happen, I guess. Nothing that can't be explained. Like, I had a buddy stay at my house one night when my wife and daughter were with her sister visiting her grandfather, and he said that he was awoken in the early morning by two male voices discussing something. He asked if I had somebody come to the door in the middle of the night, and I hadn't. But other than that, there's really nothing out there. That said though, in our most recent home, about three months ago, my daughter began experiencing night terrors too. I had them as a kid and they're truly heartbreaking. The only thing that I can do is hold her arms and head still so she doesn't hurt herself. She'll scream at me, growl, hit me, throw herself around, the whole works. Everything that I've read said that they don't remember from the next day and they're asleep for the whole thing. It's really heartbreaking though, but... It makes me feel better knowing that she doesn't really remember the incidences. Anyway, around the same time this started, things started moving around in the house. What I mean is that we'll hear cabinets open and shut, hear something thump or bang, and I've even seen shadow figures hiding around walls as I walk past. One night, while reading to her, she and I both witnessed a sock move itself across her bedroom floor. I know she saw it too because when I walked her by the spot on the floor to get her out of the room, she stopped and looked down at it, clearly puzzled. I tried to play it off to her and my wife and I chalked it up to air currents, but there's just no way that that was an air current. After this though, I saged the home immediately and I've been trying to keep everyone's minds off of it, but it's getting worse. My daughter is waking up in the middle of the night screaming no or mine. Sometimes she seems like she's having a conversation with someone, but when we go to investigate, obviously nothing is there and she's fast asleep. Last night too, I had something happen on the baby monitor that I just couldn't explain. I took some photos of it, but unfortunately I really don't have a way of sharing them here. But in a nutshell, for about 30 seconds, I could see a really large shadowy head behind my daughter's own head on the monitor. I took a photo of it on my phone to send to my buddy to see what he thought. My wife was asleep at this point with our four-month-old. When I checked the monitor again, though, it was gone. To me, it was clear as day, and although he says that he sees it, he does think that it could just be a shadow. Anyhow... I'm pretty much at my wit's end now. I'm terrified that I've harbored something all these years from my own childhood, and now it's planning to torment my daughter. Does anyone have any experience with this or any advice? Anything at all at this point, I'll take it. I thought the saging would help, but 
I don't know, it, it almost seemed to like tick it off even more and maybe it's made things even worse. So I just moved into a new house guys and I'll be honest, I'm really scared. I've been living here for about a month now, it's newly constructed, a couple of years. The first couple of weeks too, I felt really good. It felt so bright and cheery, everything felt great. I got great vibes from everything about it. It felt like I'd made a great decision. Also, just to quickly preface this, I do have a carbon monoxide detector. I put it on the first night. So, my first couple of nights sleeping here, it already started. I would have ordered... I would have auditory hallucinations right before falling asleep, which I've never really had before. I would hear a whisper in my ear. The first one was, hello, how are you? And I quickly snapped awake. Then it's been the sounds of yelling, people bustling around me, etc. But I quickly snap up and when I do, nobody's there. I quickly started having vivid nightmares every night as well. I don't usually have vivid dreams and haven't had nightmares in like forever. It would be things like seeing the inside of my body and my heart was like infested with larvae. They were sort of squirming in and out of me and I'd see my house swarming with infestations. I'd be hurt, tortured, killed. My insides were always usually had something going wrong with them. But I shrugged this all off as it is just dreams admittedly, even though it is a bit scary. But on the third week, everything quickly went downhill. I decided to do a full tank change on my axolotl tank. It falls and crushes my fingers and leg. Then I discover a large ant infestation in the tank below it. They were so disgusting. They left like a black gooey grime everywhere that they were, festering in the corners, crawling over one another, and it made me really wretch and gag. I quickly went out, vacuumed, sprayed, and really cleaned everything up as best as I could and placed traps. I was done with the tank change when I noticed all of the poison ants start running to the inside of the tank below, drowning and sort of killing themselves in it. I emergency move the fish into another tank and a pregnant black widow crawls up from the side. I spray her down and move her out. Then a mystery hole appears in the drywall. Spiders crawl out, crawl on the ceiling and jump onto me from the ceiling while I'm in bed. I have a high loft bed. The pest people have no clue what made the hole, but it just keeps getting bigger as well. They find no termites or any cause for it. But then I notice the fish shelf is breaking. I go out to buy a new shelf and Lowe's catches on fire while I'm in it. I leave and go wherever else I can to find a new shelf, get one and move my tanks onto it when all the glass on the tank breaks and they all fall. This new tank, less than a year old and a good brand, just suddenly like burst. I put them in a bucket and buy them a new tank. I clean and add a new filter, new heater, feed them good night. I wake up and all of their skin is now falling off and they're half dead. I emergency change the water and it's no good. Then my cat gets cat fleas and I don't know where and how. He starts to retch and vomit and peeing blood. Half of my electrical appliances met their end in these few days. I threw away so many things that it pains me, in fact. Like things for my fish, extension cords, vacuums, my hair curler fizzled and burned, the heater on the tank stopped heating and it instead sent electrical shocks everywhere. But mind you, this all happened in the last few days after the hello and the dreams. You could say it's just bad luck and bugs, I know, but... I don't know, it just seems like too much at once for me, and it just doesn't feel right. My dreams, maybe they tried to warn me, and this whole time there is some sort of rhythmic tapping in the ceiling too. No scurrying, AC heaters off, no water damage or anything, but it knocks every hour or so. Sometimes it's short knocking, sometimes it's long, it's not consistent. It's always from the same spot though. Sometimes there's a bang too. That one happened in different spots, usually above my head. Sometimes I hear knocking at the door and when I go to answer, there's nobody there. I also keep 
while seeing stuff out of the corner of my eyes. No figure, just like a shadow or a light moving across the room. It also feels like large bugs are crawling under my skin sometimes that I'm in the house and it like burns, like I'm on fire almost. Although this could be because I'm on such high alert. I don't know. I am really scared, so it could be anxiety, I know that. Anyway, this all happens in a few days and I left and went to stay at my dad's for a few days because I just couldn't take it anymore. And I felt really good there. But as soon as I came back and stepped foot inside this house, I just feel so much dread. I feel so much better as soon as I step outside, but one step inside and my stomach suddenly drops. What happened to the good vibes the first couple of weeks? It feels so dark and like I'm trapped in here. It used to feel so light and free, but the horrors and the problems, they just never seem to end now. The pest people sprayed after I found the ants, but they found no large issues. They sprayed anyways because I needed it for peace, I guess, but the spiders, they keep coming back and they still haunt me. The hole is still there. The whispers, the dreams, the death of my fish. I love them so much and they find nothing in the attic. I make sure they check it many times, but why does the tapping not end? These days... I sleep with all the lights on in this dreaded house to the sound of that tapping and it just won't stop. I've noticed that it's most often in bouts of nines and sevens and it keeps getting louder as well, I, I swear. I need help guys, I don't know what I'm dealing with, I don't know what to do, please help me. So I moved into a new house about 18 months ago. My special needs cousin and my brother live with me. Three weeks ago, my brother woke up in the middle of the night and decided to sit outside and have a cigarette. He said that he heard the gate open and looked up and the landlord's boyfriend, they live next door, was sneaking into the yard apparently. My brother yelled at him and he tried to act like he wasn't there. My brother got up and the guy ran back to his house. But if this wasn't strange enough, he's been caught four times this week putting his hand through the window and moving the blinds so that he can watch us. I caught him personally a few nights ago standing on a box to peek into my bedroom. I put dead leaves under our window so that we can hear him and it worked. We caught him sneaking behind our house at about 1am. The next morning at 7am I got a call from the landlord telling me to remove the leaves they can't see them from their house. You have to be behind my house to see them at all. It's kind of scary and I've been sleeping with my gun and my dog at this point. I feel like if I do anything about this that I'll end up on the streets. It's almost impossible to find another rental where I live at the moment. To be honest, I'm really not sure what to do. We're moving out of this place tomorrow, I think. But I think we're about to move out of this place tomorrow because I left the house for 20 minutes today and somebody had definitely broken in. As of right now, I, I feel like I have only two choices. Shoot the man or leave in the morning. I'm purchasing an RV tomorrow so that I have somewhere to stay temporarily. I have a little bit of money saved and my boss is helping with the rest. All I can say is that I'm thankful for the people in my life's help. After I get all of my stuff out, I'm going to talk to the police and the property manager. Hopefully she won't help them rent this to anyone else. I doubt the police will do much though since, well, I don't really have much proof. But anyways, here's to moving on. This happened a few years ago when I was working at a hospital. I was taking my lunch break and wanted to have some alone time in my car. I was an assistant who sat at the front desk all day so I needed time to myself for relaxing. And after getting lunch in our cafeteria, I start walking outside to go to my car. I walk out one of the main entrances that's across from our behavioral health facility. I see this lady who I assume was a patient as she was in green scrubs and was holding a brown paper sack and just sort of standing around the entrance. She didn't look like medical staff and had blood on her scrubs as well. 
I also made the assumption that she may have been discharged from behavioral health or something. Anyway, as I walked past her, she shouts at me, Hey ma'am, can I get a ride? And I stopped to look at her and shook my head, said no sorry. I felt guilty as she probably didn't have anyone to call herself, but she quickly replied, very offended, why? Which, that to me meant that it wasn't a good idea to engage and she probably would have been really angry at any excuse that I gave her. So I turned away and I just kept walking to my car. Once I get into my car, I lock the doors and turn it on to listen to some music. As soon as I start to eat my food, the lady in the green scrubs appears at my driver's side door and is yelling at me and knocking on the window. I don't know what she's saying as I'm pretty startled and looking at her in disbelief. The parking lot that I was in was pretty huge as this held most of the staff who worked at the hospital. So I was pretty shocked to know that she had been following me the whole time without me noticing. And it's also really weird that she felt the need to follow me without shouting more at me or to get my attention or anything. I was too stunned to say anything to her but she suddenly went to the back passenger door and tried to open it. I see that she can't actually open the door because I locked them when I got inside. But seeing this, I quickly grabbed my phone and dialed 911. I was shaking, I had no idea what this lady was capable of or if she was going to leave at all. But the fact that she was trying to open my car door to force me to give her a ride? I don't know what I would have done if she actually got in there, but I think my fight or flight mode would have kicked in and I would have had to physically remove her myself if I felt threatened. In any case, as soon as dispatch answers my phone call, the lady was slowly walking away from my car and then I didn't see her at all. Now, our hospital has its own sort of like police department, so when I told dispatch where I was, she transferred me to the hospital PD. I tell them what happened, what the lady looked like, what parking lot I was in, and they asked if I felt safe to walk back to work and that an officer would escort me, but I declined. I kind of felt silly for feeling that afraid and I didn't want to seem weak by needing the police to walk me back. I wait in the car for a few minutes and see our PD circling the lot a few times. I assumed that she was never found because I didn't see where she walked off to and I never saw police stopped anywhere talking to anyone that may have been the lady or anything. I was shaking during my whole lunch break and didn't feel like eating anymore. Nothing like that had happened to me before and I'm always paranoid when a stranger walks up to me and asks for like help or money or anything. I always want to help but my gut always tells me that it's just never really a good idea. I could have told her that there were phones inside the hospital she could use to call someone for a ride I suppose but knowing what happened later that probably wouldn't have helped. And I had seen that she was talking to other people outside before I walked past her at the entrance, so she had been asking many people, I assume. I feel bad as she probably has some sort of mental health issues or something, but I know it doesn't excuse her behavior. I didn't tell anyone when I got back to work either. I just wanted to move on with my day like it never happened. I didn't want anyone to make a fuss over it. Thankfully, nothing else has happened like that again, and I always walk with purpose when I'm leaving or going to my car these days and having pepper spray helps a little too. I'm really glad that I have the habit of immediately locking my doors once I'm inside my car though because honestly who knows what could have happened if I hadn't have locked the doors that day. So I'm female, 31, states away from house on a business trip. About an hour ago, around 8.30pm here, I had just gotten back to my room from a work dinner. And I heard shuffling in the hallway, peeked out the peephole. I saw a figure seemingly outside the room to the left of mine, looking outwards. They were knocking lightly and said twice, quickly, hello. Then it sounded like the door opened and closed. I was like, huh, okay, they must have forgotten what room they were in or something and someone let them in. I walk back to the main part of my room and I hear shuffling again. I look out and see a figure. Can't really make out what the person looks like, but I see them on the other side of my room this time and again I hear light knocking and hello. Now I'm starting to get a weird spidery sense of like, what the heck is going on? 
I see the figure leave and think, okay, that was weird. Then I again start hearing shuffling. I start walking toward the hotel room door and hear a light knock on what sounds to be my door, I think. And again I hear, hello, hello. And immediately after this, someone attempts to open my door. Thank God I had the cross latch pulled over, not the deadbolt though. My heart stopped as I stood there and watched the door hit the latch and fall back shut. I called the front desk and informed them that someone had just tried entering my room and I'm not staying with anyone. The front desk attendant just replied, I don't have any housekeeping up there. To which I replied, okay, well that's concerning. Can you please send someone up to check around? The attendant replied that there was no manager on duty. To which I asked if I could call the police instead because I was very worried as I started to cry a bit. She replied that I should do what I thought I needed to do and I hung up and cried for a bit, not sure what to do. I didn't want to ask for another room because I was too scared to leave now. But 10 minutes later the hotel phone starts ringing. I was honestly feeling really scared to answer but I did. It was the front desk attendant and she said the police were going to be coming to my room and she didn't want me to panic when I heard someone knock on the door. I said okay and I hung up. I sat there and thought, how do I know that this is actually legit? Whoever tried to access my room had a key, otherwise how else would the door have actually opened? A few minutes later, as expected, I hear a knock. I looked out the peephole and saw two male officers. I didn't ask to see ID, which in hindsight it probably would have been the smart thing to do, but I was so shaken up and not really thinking straight. I opened the door and they asked what was going on and so I told them all that I explained earlier. They said it was good that I had the cross latch pulled over because the door would have opened if not and I responded that it's a hotel, what do you mean? What's the point of the access card then and we wiggled the handle. But we were in the hallway talking with my door open. Then they took a pause and they were like, oh, it automatically locks? Again, I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, it's a hotel. So then they had me shut the door and open it with a key to test it. Sure enough, it didn't open without the access card. Then they said it was probably housekeeping. I responded that the front desk attendant told me that there was no housekeeping up here when I called. Plus, it was like 8.30 p.m., why would housekeeping be coming by that time unless I'd requested someone to come by? Plus, I noticed housekeeping had already been by during the day because my trash was emptied and the dirty towel was gone. They ultimately told me that they thought that it was housekeeping and not to worry, but if anything else happened or I felt unsafe, then I should call them. They also said that if I wanted to change rooms that they were sure the hotel would accommodate this. I said okay while crying and they left. And now I'm sitting in my room crying, laying under the covers in my clothes. I'm sure that I won't be sleeping tonight. I'm also too afraid to change rooms because I don't want to leave this room now. I have the cross latch pulled over and the deadbolt locked. I think that I'm safe. Am I being paranoid? I don't know. Was it housekeeping? Should I do something different? I don't know what that was, but all I know is that... I can't wait for this to be over. So there was a house in my hometown that I've always been fascinated with since I was a young child. It was on a main road and whenever I rode by it, I would try to imagine what it was like living in that house. And I had a clear picture in my mind of what it was like inside. In late 2019, my husband and I were on our way to visit my sister, and along the way we see that house that I loved from my childhood was listed for sale. We were renting and happy, but something told me that we should buy that house. I looked it up on Redfin and calculated that the mortgage would actually cost less than our rent, and it was recently renovated, so there shouldn't be many upfront costs. We found a realtor, toured the house, put an offer in, and it was accepted in 24 hours. Our offer was accepted in March of 2020, right before the housing market exploded and property values went through the roof. The seller was very eager to work with us and correct every single thing that came up in the inspection, and even corrected some things that we didn't ask for. In fact, she went way above and beyond to make sure that we didn't back out. 
In any case, we moved in and we quickly discover that the house is really, like, haunted. Never anything sinister, but something in the house definitely wants us to know that it's there and it likes things a certain way. The details could be an entirely different post, but two previous homeowners have confirmed that they've experienced paranormal activity there too. A person who lived in the house in the 90s actually stopped by to talk about it when he was in town visiting. The thing that concerns me is that these folks have experienced things that were much more sinister than we have. I think the creepy details here are that the house's layout and style are exactly as I envisioned them as a kid too. It sounds silly I know, but I used to draw the layout in the sand when I played house as a little kid, and I even tried to recreate the house in The Sims when I was in high school. The other creepy thing though is, well, the dreams. You see, as we were closing, my husband and I had some insanely vivid dreams about the house and its occupants. Again, nothing sinister or scary, I guess, but definitely weird. Notable history of the house, too, is that it was built by a local mason in 1928 as a retirement cottage for him and his wife. It was their dream home, and the descendants of his family are still in the area and have asked to come over and see it. They have a real attachment to the house, too. Apparently, somebody ended their own life in there in 2002. The second night that we slept in the house, a blade from the ceiling fan in our bedroom became detached and flew across the room. The fan is apparently mounted where the light fixture that this man ended his own life with was located. There were reports of paranormal activity before this and this man had a, a gambling problem, I, I believe. They got a foreclosure notice and his wife filed for divorce in the month before, well, everything went down, so... I really don't believe that it was related to the paranormal activity, but who knows. I guess what I'm wondering though is, why do I have such a connection to this house? And how likely is whatever is here to be as benign as it appears to my husband and me? I still love this house and have no desires to leave, but I also am aware that a ceiling fan blade flying across the room like that and almost hitting one of us is not your average haunting. When I was about four or five, I was at my grandmother's home, several stories from there, and it was a rainy spring day. I remember playing in the living room since I couldn't go out, but the front door was open, but the screen glass exterior door was closed still. At some point, I noticed an old man dressed in a black suit, a white shirt, large brim black hat, standing at the end of the walk facing the door, about 30 feet out. I remember he seemed sort of out of place at the time and it sort of struck me, even at a young age, as being sort of, well, disturbing I guess. I ran to get my grandma because everything about it scared me and she sensed the terror and ran back to the front door area with me. When I looked back down the end of the walk, the man was nowhere to be seen. But chills ran down my spine as my grandmother placed a hand on my shoulder, proceeded to back up slowly and started yelling, you get out of here. When I looked up at her, she had a glare in her eyes, locked on the door and repeatedly yelled, get out of here while pulling me back. I then looked at the upper half of the door where she was pointing and saw the old man standing what would have been inches from the glass portion upper half of the door, but I had just been inches from the lower half screen and saw nothing. He only appeared in the upper half of the door if that makes sense and my grandmother backed us up to the hallway and when we got there she turned quickly and darted us off to the kitchen. I remember this so clearly too. There were many other experiences in that home but that one definitely stands out and has stuck with me my entire life. This happened when I was like four or five, a few days or weeks after Easter. You see, that year I had eaten an awful lot of chocolate and ultimately, well, I was pretty blocked up. This led to me being kind of disgusted by it, I suppose, to the point that I had officially declared that I hated chocolate. And this, believe it or not, was actually what saved my life, I think. That day, my parents and I were walking down the avenue, and I asked my parents if I could run, and they said yes. 
man who probably thought that I was alone decided to approach me. I don't know how accurate my memories are, but I definitely recall him being extremely close to my face. He offered me a chocolate bar with the creepiest grin ever, and I politely declined and argued that I didn't like chocolate anymore. I remember being really calm and not really scared much. I was just a toddler, so I don't think I realized what was happening. My parents immediately intervened though and scared this guy away. They told me that I'd done a great job refusing that man's offer because, well, maybe he could have poisoned it, or worse. And I think this is what really scared me at the time. I still love chocolate these days, but I thank God almost every day that back then I didn't. Before I start this, I just want to say that we are that couple in a horror movie. My boyfriend and I, we've been together for a year now and we've recently found out that I was pregnant with our first baby. After we found out, we decided that we needed to get our lives together and buy our first house and move in together. After a few months of searching for our perfect home, we found one in the market, in our price range, just begging for us to buy it with the previous owners keen to sell it to us as soon as possible. Now, growing up, I've always been aware of spirits and stuff, not seeing them or anything, but I would feel things and hear typical things when things were quiet. It was common for me growing up. My boyfriend is the same, but he often saw them while growing up and has always been scared of his gift, so he tries to block it out most of the time. After moving in, I started to feel a presence, I guess you could say, often while I was home alone, especially in the mornings or late at night. It's not a, a nice presence. I would always get the feeling of absolute dread. I would get too scared to move, or my muscles would go tight, and I feel like I might have had a panic attack at one stage, but as fast as it's brought on, it also leaves that quickly as well, leaving me a little bit shaken. I mostly get this feeling down one end of the house that I don't really go down very often, or in the baby's room in the walk-in robe, which I can't go in without turning the light on straight away. My boyfriend has also said in the mornings when he comes home alone, I leave for work at 5 in the morning and he doesn't leave until 7, that he would get the feeling that he's just not alone and often rushes out the door due to a, a feeling of uneasiness. Only recently have we both really confided in each other about the scary feelings that we get while home alone, and I feel since we've been talking about our experiences, the more frequent they're becoming. Like the other night, I woke up at around 1.30 in the morning, which I now do frequently, but has only become a thing since moving into this house. I laid there for a bit and listened to my boyfriend grinding his teeth, wishing that he'd be quiet when the feeling of dread just hit me so unexpectedly and sudden that I couldn't move. I felt my heartbeat racing in my chest. I went freezing cold and I was too scared to even open my eyes. I could have sworn too that someone was pacing around the bed, walking from my boyfriend's side to my side and then back again. Eventually, after what felt like hours, but it was probably only minutes, it stopped at the end of the bed. I know, cliche horror stuff. I eventually got the courage though to open my eyes and... Again, I could have sworn that I saw the silhouette of someone at the end of the bed. I immediately picked up my phone, switched the torch on, and you already know how this ends, right? Nothing was there. So I left my torch on for a bit and cuddled into my boyfriend, who was still asleep, to calm myself down a bit, and then I turned the light off and went back to sleep, no dramas, got up at 5am and headed to work. But... After I left my boyfriend that morning, he told me that he had a horrible nightmare that was set in the house and someone was trying to drown him when he woke up, he felt like someone was pulling on his legs and when he kicked out, he felt like he'd actually kick someone. He quickly sat up and again, nobody was there. He said that he's never gotten ready for work quicker in his life and he was also an hour early. So yeah... We are that couple in a horror movie at the moment that bought a haunted house. We're currently looking into cleansing our home to get rid of whatever this is. 
but we are straight up not having a good time and if anyone has any suggestions on how to remove something like this that would be great my mum's dog Punky rest in peace was a very sweet and loving dog she was an ESA dog, but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never really seen her get aggressive with anyone in like the entire 12 years that she lived. She never growled or even nipped at anyone and she had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terrier at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here is that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I really only ever saw it once. So I, an 11 year old female, was at home with my siblings, two male and six female. My then stepdad is at work and my mum ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, not a dead end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down a, a rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer having a grand time watching YouTube videos, I think, when all of a sudden, all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figure that they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, too. I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think that I've heard her bark like this, like, ever. Her bark is more of a baying sound, I guess, because of her breed and everything, but this was a big, loud, and alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Three knocks. We never really got visitors because of how weird our house was, location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they never knocked. So I, I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky. And I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of the New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a little bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man that I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly too. He was really thin, taller man, with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes and his half-manged hair. Sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin as well. A little too shallow and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, I guess, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer-looking t-shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on or something. All his clothes were dark, too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up or taped over, maybe? In any case, I stare up at him in confusion because... I definitely don't know this man and I ask what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that was just way too fake. Like this exaggerated and really forced grin and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Like, hey there kiddo, I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. And he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head obviously because he just seems so... Off... Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is really unnerving because he probably knew that they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, I know that, that I'd have to go and get my mum, something like that, except for what I did say. 
Instead, I, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things. And he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out at this point and I think to close the door, but the thing is, is that our front door didn't really, well, lock. It was a small town, hard to access home. We never really needed a lock, to be honest. So that was basically useless. And I'm sure that there's something very wrong about to happen. And I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think that I have before it does happen. When all of a sudden, I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground, and her teeth bared and snarling like she was absolutely feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her eyes were down, and she was ready to pounce. The guy, he hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me, and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word. He booked it down the driveway as I let Pinky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing this guy. Our small dogs, they chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about. But Punky, uh, Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just sort of staring in the distance until he finally disappears. To this day, I swear that I saw someone join up with him running when he got onto the road. The second that he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog that I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realize that my siblings are still down and call to run to check on them and when I get to the bedroom my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But it was then that I noticed that the bedroom window was wide open curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in the front of the window all shoved around. Someone had definitely been trying to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch where Punky was sleeping so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off and the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mum inside while our dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do obviously, but after my mum got home, she took us all to my aunt's house and on our way, we saw the men walking up somebody else's driveway. Men, plural as well. We watched a second one split off to wait by the road. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a, a movie, and then to get some ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though. My parents were happy and proud of my sister. We had a great time and we took our time getting home as well. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my mum to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember too thinking that it seemed a little bit more chilly in the house that night but that's really the only thing out of the ordinary that I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change too when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong but I knew that it was bad because I heard the fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really badly so I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there and her and my parents were standing very close my mum looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked what was wrong mum but she didn't want to tell me. 
She said that we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door, I heard my dad talking to 911, an operator, and telling them that when we got home, we found our backsliding glass door shattered and objects strewn throughout the kitchen. We went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me, to be honest. But the police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside, flashing lights illuminating our entire street for like hours. They never found anybody in the house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. But the thing that really gets me is that nothing was ever stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did was take our canned food out of the pantry and stack them into like small pyramids in our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to different parts of the house, which was really creepy looking back on it. It was like an insane person had been in our home and did things for reasons that really only made sense to him. Anyway, as the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mum a question. They talked quietly and I'm sure that they thought that I didn't hear it. I pretended not to be listening, but I heard everything. And well, you see, we keep magnetized letters on our fridge. I think I had gotten them for a birthday present a few years before or something. And we used them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mum if the message on there that night was done by any of us. And it wasn't. And I watched my mum turn pale when he told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day because it said, always watching. The police, they never did find any fingerprints. They said the intruder must have been wearing gloves. And for the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. I was absolutely positive that the intruder was still in the house somehow. That there was a hidden place nobody knew about where he could hide and listen to us. I never really shook the feeling that somebody was there. And within a few months, we ended up deciding to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area, so we moved to a house several miles away. Thankfully, we were never bothered again, but I still do think about it. Was it kids just playing a prank? Was it some insane person that wanted to torment a random family? Or was it someone that truly had it out for us and who really was always watching? Could it have been a neighbor or someone that we knew? These questions still keep me up at night sometimes. This obviously happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck stand up sometimes when I'm alone at home and I have to check the house to make sure that no one is hiding in it. Must have been about 4.45 in the afternoon. My aunt was home alone since my parents were at work and I was on my way home. She heard a knock at the door and went to answer it when the dogs continued barking, meaning that it wasn't a quick delivery or something like that. And she was met with three Caucasian young adult men. They were all wearing black matching uniforms, though we don't know if they were actually uniforms or not, I guess. They came in a white van with blue letters on it. English isn't her first language, so it was hard for her to understand what they were saying because they talked too fast for her. But she did understand when they asked for me by name. She told them that I wasn't and they immediately left. They didn't leave a message for me or a note or a business card or anything. When I got home shortly after, she told me that some people had been looking for me. They weren't family, obviously, or she would have known them, and they weren't friends of mine. They don't sound like any religious group I've ever heard of before, or they didn't go to our neighbor's houses or anything, too. They came to our house specifically, and they knew me by my first name as well. I'm worried about them coming back again, and my aunt doesn't live with us. Usually, I would be the one home alone at that hour, and I'm curious as to who they were and what they wanted with me. But I'm also scared to think of how it would have gone if I had actually opened the door instead. Uh, 
I've dealt with the paranormal side ever since uh, I can remember. But this, but this is the story that happened in Mount Juliet, Tien. My wife and I moved in sometime in September of 2014. We bought the home at auction and it needed a lot of work. The home was built in 1969 and it was all original to that date, even down to the shag carpet still being there. But the house sat on 12 acres though, with only 3 acres cleared around the home other than some random trees, but the rest was fully wooded. The basement, man, the basement was gross and musty. The ceilings were low in places with the pipes and duct working running throughout it. And I have to admit that it had a, a really odd sort of strange feeling when walking down there. The previous owners left a deep freezer down there and what they had inside of it made me question the things that they were doing in that basement. The freezer was full of different animal carcasses that had been stripped of meat. Random bone pieces with bits of fur still attached. There was also a gallon bucket sitting in there full of blood. Our very first night staying there, my brother and sister decided to stay over with us. But we're all hanging out anyway and it got late so they just decided to stay. And while we were there, we were unpacking boxes and decorating for Halloween and whatnot. I started walking the empty boxes and totes down to the basement. And while down there, something caught my eye. I saw what looked like a slim box sitting on top of the ductwork. I walked over and pulled the box down and sure enough it was an old 70s Ouija board. Not thinking too much about it, I, I grabbed it and brought it upstairs and sat it on our dining room hutch for decoration. The night was getting late though and we are all getting tired. It had to have been around midnight and we decided to head up to the second floor and get some sleep. All the bedrooms were dispersed on the second floor. My wife and I took the master bedroom and my brother and sister took rooms of their own. We laid there trying to doze off when suddenly we heard what sounded like closet doors sliding and slamming shut and the sound of running and stomping back and forth in the hallway. My wife had me get up to tell my brother and sister to stop that before we were trying to get to sleep. I get up and go to each of their rooms and ask, what are you guys doing? We're trying to sleep and in their words they said, I thought that that was you guys. I decided to grab my gun at this point thinking that maybe someone had broken into the house or something. I slowly walked downstairs clearing each room as I went along. My wife, brother and sister followed behind with a gun of their own. We cleared every room that there was in that house and suddenly it dawned on my sister, it's the Ouija board. I quickly grabbed it from the hutch cabinet and took it back to the basement and after that it was silent for the rest of the night. Now as time went on whatever this thing was it was making itself known. We would have to block the basement door shut because we were constantly finding it open. Anytime we had to go down into the basement we would always feel something down there and it was demonic for a, a lack of a better term. We would hear it walking up to the second floor, walking around the bedrooms, doors would suddenly slam shut, the lights would surge randomly. I began seeing a dark shadow figure and it wasn't just any well, spirit, whatever it was, it was completely dark. Like I said, it felt demonic. I felt like I was losing my mind at one point too. Voices were constantly in my head. Sometimes there were whispers, other times they were louder but always sounded sort of muffled. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying but it was all the time and the only time the voices weren't in my head was when I wasn't really home. We also had chickens and sheep that died for no reason. All of our vehicles constantly had problems, including my mower. And one day, as I was putting laundry away... I had the windows open to catch a summer breeze because our HVAC didn't work very well and I heard the strangest sound. So I looked out the window and listened and it was coming from the right side of the house inside the woods. It got closer and closer and that was when I saw it. This thing is the only way that I can describe it was like a werewolf of sorts 
were walking throughout our front yard and disappeared into the woods on the other side. I was really just in shock seeing it. I really didn't know what to make of it, but it looked like a, a humanoid wolf is the only way that I can describe it, just walking across the field out there. One random night too, we were watching a movie and the lights surged and we heard the basement door slowly opening. I jumped up and wedged the door shut with a chair like I always do. Another night, I walked past the basement door to find it open, no lights on, and I hear my wife down there calling my name. I thought that it was strange that she was down there, so I didn't walk down there. I then heard walking above me. I slowly walk upstairs to the second floor. I make my way up the stairs and turn the corner to find my wife in our room. I told her how I heard her voice calling my name from the basement, and to this day, I wonder, what did I actually hear, and if it wasn't my wife, then what did it want me down in the basement for? The presence continued, and it was making us feel on edge. Tired, because I was hardly sleeping now, I tossed and turned, and the voices grew louder and louder. Yet, I could never really make out what they were saying. After a few years, we decided that enough was enough and we put the house up for sale. My father-in-law was over helping work on a few things before the house hit the market. And while he was there, doors slammed shut and the voices started to enter his mind apparently as well. He even said that he could make out what they were saying and eventually we moved out and... After that, there was just nothing. This happened about six years ago in 2016. I was 18 at the time, had moved back to Portland, Oregon for college as an escape from the eight-year-old hellhole that was my life in San Diego, California. I grew up with a single mum most of my life, so I moved around a lot. I'd lived in Vancouver, Washington, the greater Portland area, for a few years prior to moving to San Diego. So when I needed an escape to leave SoCal, as soon as I graduated, going to college out of state was really the only option. I applied to Portland State University two weeks prior to the submission deadline, and I of course got in. I arrived to Portland a good six weeks prior to school starting since I had some academic programs that I got in that required an earlier presence to establish some ground before school started and all that. So there I was, 18 years old, returning nostalgically to what I called home, living in the Broadway freshman student housing and I took in my sense of freedom by going on late night walks around the, the park blocks to Rocket Fizz or Voodoo Donut just about anywhere that I could. Now that I've listened to true crime podcasts, watched a lot of true crime since I was in elementary school, thanks to my ex-sheriff mum who told jail stories for bedtime, I should have known better than to do what I did, I know that. I was notorious among my friends though for the style that I adopted, even in the autumn weather Portland has. I would wear a long XXL shirt, no pants, sneakers, and a clear transparent bag. Yes, where you can clearly see my wallet, and that I also had a weapon, everywhere that I went. Even on my 11pm to 4am walks alone, I still wore something like this. This story is about one of those lonesome late night walks too. I found a decent parking garage that I would walk to most nights, near SW 6th and Jefferson in downtown. I would chain smoke into the night, and no issues on any situation, except for this one night. It was about 1am or 2am at this time I would guess. I was heading back to my dorm room, slightly tipsy. I had passed my friends up on a party at University Point that day. So, all of my immediate contacts were inebriated at a party not too far from where I was. I found myself walking down 6th Avenue, alone. It was eerie too, given that it was a Saturday night. There was not a car or a person in sight, and I had both headphones in, focusing on not feeling coldness and heading home. 
when suddenly a, a car speeds up to where I am. Two men hop out and both go on each side of me. I pause my music and act as if I'm not freaked out. I am visibly intoxicated and probably smell faded too. Let me also mention that at this point in my life, I had shaved my head, pretty much bald, was about 135 pounds, and wore large shirts like I said. I could have been a pantless male for all they could have known. But they said, hey, how are you? Where are you headed? You seem a bit drunk. I shoot the guy on my left daggers as much as I can while all the while trying to assure myself that I can still walk straight. I'm just trying to make it home tonight, I say back. The guy on the right says, well, we can help, but we can take you to your home. Where's home at? I ignore him and I keep my pace. I didn't believe in God then, but was praying in my head that I made it home that night, promising whoever I was praying to that I wouldn't be this stupid being out late again, alone, under the influence. Both give each other a look and they start walking slower, now following behind me. I keep my pace and calculate how far I am, where my resident hall key was, and how fast I could possibly run while making it to the building without being caught by the two men on foot or their accomplices in the car. But before I could mentally provide myself those answers, the car screeches back and they all of a sudden hop in and speed off. I count my lucky stars that this happened while running back. I head to Max, it's a, a liquor store me and the gang used to chain smoke at. I call campus security and relay all the stuff that just happened to them and to my horror, I'm told that I'm the 13th call with such a report that week. I head back inside to my dorm awaiting my friends to tell them what had just occurred. Oh, but the story doesn't end there. You see, fast forward to July 2017 and I dropped out of college by the first semester. I went back to San Diego for a few months and officially moved me and my family all up to Portland. We were pretty settled in our cozy apartment where well, we were watching the news one night. and My heart sank to my stomach and I felt like I was about to vomit because there on the news, a sex trafficking ring in the next city over was busted. Quite a few faces had been shown as to who was arrested, but they were mostly women, which was interesting, with only a handful of men shown. But I did recognize two of the faces there, the two being the men from that night. Yes, I was tipsy, and yes, I was a little bit high, but I knew that those faces were theirs for sure. I called the PPD and I provided them with the information, with them verifying some call-ins around the same time period of mine were how some of the members chose to abduct. Why they didn't abduct me, I'll never know. All I know is that I'm grateful. I'm grateful that they didn't take me. I'm grateful that I ran when I did. And I'm grateful that they were caught. So around July or August of 2021, my city was under its second major lockdown where you were not allowed to have any guests over at your house and stuff like that. I had just moved back in with my parents in early July after my lease ended and I didn't renew it. I'm in my mid-twenties, my mother was a big stickler for the COVID laws so my girlfriend was not even allowed on my big front porch. <laughs> it was really annoying. But anyway... The girlfriend and I would often go for walks around a local creek near my house and we were a fresh couple so we had certain, well, let's say needs if you catch my drift. There was a hidden side path attached to the main walkway that goes through the creek that we would sneak off into to relieve ourselves. Yeah, I know it's a bit messed up but one night at about 7pm, it's winter time so it's pitch black in this creek after about 5.30 we decided to walk to our spot and my girlfriend was excited and decided to skip ahead of me. I was walking slowly while she was about 7 meters ahead. Once I turned the corner into the side area, I noticed that she was on her phone and she was acting, well, weird. Checking the weather and other apps and randomly said, Okay, it's time for me to go home now. I was just sort of like, oh, okay. She doesn't want to do it anymore, I guess. 
no worries. But as we started walking away, she whispers, there's someone right behind you. And I'm like, what? So I turn my head over my right shoulder and sure enough, there was a man in all black with his hoodie on, squatting and hiding in the bushes, just sort of staring at us. Where this bush is was on the top of a ledge about uh, three or four feet above the path. So while the man in black was squatting or crouching, our faces were basically aligned. I immediately said, what the heck? I was pretty caught off guard, so I said it weakly, and this man just didn't react at all. He didn't gasp, say hello, or excuse me, or any of the usual things a person would say if people notice each other like that, in the pitch black woods of all places. He just stared at us as we slowly walked away. I asked my girlfriend how she even noticed him, and... She said that when she walked down the trail before I got there, she saw the man on his phone and as soon as she arrived, the man in the hoodie turned his phone off. We left that walkway and went up one sort of close by. Yeah, we're idiots, I know. And as we're walking up the parallel side trail, we could see the man still hiding in the bushes staring at us. And there was only a faint light from the moon that night, but you could definitely still see him. It was a, a really creepy and unexplained event. But we never really went back there and we never intend to either. About seven years ago, during the time that I was in college, I was around 20 years old. I was highly stressed being a, a biology major. I'd fallen asleep with my office chair facing me my desk light was still on and at some point I woke up during the sleep and I was having sleep paralysis unable to move my body and what I saw sitting on my chair was the most vivid detailed and scary creature that I have ever seen in my life. I still remember it to this day. The light was still shining in the background. The creature was about three to four feet tall. It looked like an emaciated old woman. Fragile, grey pale skin and very thin as well. The nose was narrow, sharp and big. The eyes were black and dark. But there were no whites around the eyes. The hair was very brittle, thin and grey. The hands were old. Thin, bony, long fingers and the nails were so long. I would say about one to one and a half inches in length. The nails on the foot and hands were not trimmed as if they hadn't been cut. Her ears were pointy and sharp. It looked sort of like an elf, I guess, but she had a really small chin. She wore an old ragged white dress with cut out small triangular patterns. During the sleep paralysis, I stared at her for a good two minutes or so. She stared back at me. She didn't go on my chest or anything as is typical of this sort of thing. And I didn't feel suffocated during the experience. I couldn't scream or move and the thing never smiled or had any facial expressions. It was just completely blank and staring at me. What really freaked me out after the sleep paralysis experience though was that I searched up old hag and found that other people have had similar experiences with the old hag. It was a really crazy sleep paralysis experience. I've never had an experience like this again and... I never placed an office chair facing me. I felt like it was an invitation to watch me. It was wicked and it gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Especially because when I woke up, I could have sworn that the chair had moved. My parents, they introduced me to a murderer. Well, a man capable of murder anyway, and we just didn't know it yet. He was a down-to-earth stoner, with three kids and another on the way, with a super sweet wife who was a, a little bit crazy, I guess. He came over, would tell my parents everything going on in his life, then disappear for a few days. He always came back with some crazy stories, but never would assume anything bad about him from them. He'd tell us how his wife stabbed him in the foot at one point, how the kids dug a hole in their trailer, 
that his mother-in-law was psycho and once he came over on the run for having a gun at his mother-in-law's. He was there and gone in like five minutes. I regularly check our state circuit court and the dude was never in legal trouble when I looked him up, so I assumed that he just had family issues and maybe a couple of screws loose. But the last time that I saw him, he came over and smoked with my mum and my girl, told us how excited he was for this baby in the way and, and hoped that he looked more like him than the last one who was a clone of his mama. We all hung out together outside and drove the kids around in the ATV, just messing about, about our pasts and our futures and whatnot. He was hopeful. Not a bone in his body said aggressive. He was very empathic, very family orientated, and just really kind all around, I guess. But then, then he went missing for two weeks. And not a peep from him or his wife. But we then see his picture on the news with... The title, Murderer, takes his own life with his name attached. He apparently killed someone, took his body and dumped it. And when the police tried talking to him while he was in his car, he turned, looked at the police and, well, ended his own life. I'm really confused and will never really hear the full story, I guess. Two dead men, no closure for anyone. But because of this man, I think that I'll forever wonder who else I know that is capable of murder.